We are live. Uh. Yes, we are now live, and everyone must hear our voices. The voices of the damn and darkness that envelops our souls. Anyway, we get it. You never got over your emo phase. <laughs> I was waiting for someone to say that. <laughs> Revelry in the dark. We get it. Your everyday life is a Shadow the Hedgehog cosplay. Revelry in the dark. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wait, before we start reading, fun, you want to know a fun fact? No. Fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> fun fact, today is International Lesbian Day. Today is? Yes, I think, I think it's just International Lesbian Day. I don't think it's, I, for, and it might be vis vis Visibility Day. I fucking, I don't know. I think that's a different day. But yes, the lesbians have taken over the planet for one singular day. Oh, yeah, it's International Lesbian Day. For Yay! Yeah. The lesbians are taking over the planet. There, for no, them. there will soon be no more men. Right, I don't see why that's an issue. I, I, <laughs> I guess it kind of would be an issue. You are... <laughs> Why? I guess would you ask that men are left? I like <laughs> that. Wouldn't you also be gone though with the men? Yeah. So would Momo. Yeah, I'd be gone. The world Unless you want this to turn into why the last man, <laughs> where like every single thing with a Y chromosome dies. Don't you? Penguin, don't you remember we turned uh, Momo into a trans Neko on a one stream? mission. I think that we did not no, succeed that mission. I think I would have. I think I would have noticed that. Yeah, you would have, for some reason, some random stranger would have sent you a pair of cat ears in the mail. I think I would have I would have noticed. Yeah. I would be tempted to do that, Momo. I, I, two more things before we start reading. I need to go get water. And fun fact, Sam O'Neill took so long to upload a new video that someone went through an almost entire I I, I posted in dump post, I'm pretty sure. Someone went through an entire medical transition in that time. That's how long that motherfucker took to upload. Anyways, Ooh. I'm gonna go get water. Your mom. What? Mama said who, so I said your mom. That's news to me. <laughs> so I was asking who who transitioned. And if it's my mom, I think I would have you know I think I would have heard about that. They haven't come out yet. Uh, I don't know how you got insider information that I don't have. Like, she doesn't even actually know that I'm doing this, so I'm not sure how you managed to <laughs> navigate all of that. Is it possible to uh, is this just make revenge? a corpse attraction? Is transgender? this just revenge for me not... Is this is this just revenge for me not uh, transitioning? <laughs> transitioning into what? A trans. They want me to be a cat girl, and <laughs> I don't want to be a cat girl because I'm oh, not. I, I am neither a cat okay nor a girl. You are. Nobody has to transition into anything. Like, I remember this now. The last fucking time I was here, they were trying to pink pill the shit out of me. <laughs> yeah, we were. Okay. For way too if, long. If no, if no pink pill, what about purple pill? Purple yeah, I think pill? I'm... I think I'm solid still. What I, think if I'll, I... I think I'll make it. Uh, What if I give you SCP-113? Ooh. 
Which one is that? The stone. Wait, wait, which, which, what does it do? Uh, the hermaphrodite stone. I think, I think I'll pass. <laughs> no, because the thing is, you would be fine, though, because it only, I don't think it swaps what you are, it swaps to what you, you are, and, like, mentally. Swaps you, no matter if you are trans or not. That's why trans people like it, and other people do not like it. Oh, I thought it was just if you're trans. Oops. No. No. No, it's it, that sounds more like an SCP thing now. That it it just changes you no matter what. Yeah. Yes. It is not a magical stone that can tell if you're trans or not. It'll just swap you. It'll oh. Yeah. I'm not sure if anyone knows, but the the Reddit uh eight bit uh for you whatever I think it's called. I don't, I don't remember what it's called, but it contains like a bunch of subreddits and that are drawn 8-bit or whatever. Uh, they put SCP-113 next to the trans flag. Huh. They also nice. put the GOC uh, symbol right next to a bunch of monsters. <laughs> I'm not sure how I feel about that. Those poor monsters. <laughs> Anyway, are we ready? I'm, I'm no. ready. I'm Talk ready, Frederica. <laughs> Hold on. You know what? I'm, I'm going to get my water that's one foot away from me. Because I think it would be wise to not be di dehydrated. What? Holy shit. I'm not sure if you heard the bottle slam my desk. Yes. Yeah. I accidentally dropped it and it fell on the desk. <laughs> God almighty. But anyway, let's do this. What, Momo? Yes. You're glitching out for a second. Can you second. hear me? Yeah, you're glitching out for oh. a second. Yeah. Oh, okay. At least for me. Was <laughs> Momo glitching out for anyone else? Yeah, Momo was, was glitching out. Okay, I was. I was. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'll bring it closer. How's that? Oh, uh, okay. That's better. Good, yeah. All right. Right on. Um, then yeah, I guess I'll I'll move forward with this. There we are. Chapter five, entropy, part one. In the original game, the sixth world was Pluto. Ironically, despite being the smallest planet, Pluto was the largest and most diverse world in the game. Entropy had a different layout, but was similarly huge and diverse. The board music was played by a violin instrument. A melody that started out sounding mournful and then it gets rather, I guess I would call it distorted. It made me feel depressed and unnerved. Not something I would want to hear while trying to sleep. Strangely, none of the levels from the previous worlds were present here. Instead, there were eight brand new icons. The bosses this time were Megalon, Batra, and Mechagodzilla. As usual, the first thing I did was go out, was go to the quiz level for another interrogation from Face. But when I got there, I noticed something different. Instead of the usual goofy Ghidra music, it was the password theme. 
the music changed seemed to be inter uh, intentional because after the first two questions at the start, the quiz started to take on a darker tone. Quiz three. Question one. Do you like ice cream? Answer, yes. Reaction, weird face number one. Do you like clowns? Question two. Do you like clowns? Answer, yes. Reaction, weird face number ten. Question three. Is time slipping through your finger? Answer, yes. Reaction. Weird face number two. Question four. Do you have any regrets? Answer, yes. Reaction, hurt. Question five. Do some people deserve to die? Answer, no. Reaction, weird face three. Question six. Is it safe to go out at night? Answer, yes. Reaction, weird face number five. Question seven. Do you find it hard to sleep at night? Answer, yes. Reaction, weird face number nine. Question eight. Have you killed, ever killed anyone? Answer, no. Reaction, weird face number seven. Question nine. Do you want to kill anyone? Answer, no. Reaction, angry. Question ten. Are you actually accomplishing anything? Answer, no. Reaction, weird face number four. Question 11. Does life have any real meaning? Answer, no. Reaction, love. Question 12. Do you like Mothra? Answer, no. Reaction, Maniacal. I knew the last one was going to be a gameplay related question, but I had no idea what the results would be. I answered honestly because, as I said I before, I never liked Mothra. Nobody liked playing as Mothra in the game. There was a good reason for that. Every other time Mothra gets hit, she gets slammed back to the left corner of the screen and she sucks at fighting because her attacks are so weak. The only benefit Mothra had was being able to fly over obstacles in some levels. So I answered no. And Face actually replied back to me. Not only with that maniacal expression, but with text. Too bad. I was taken back to the map screen. And I was shocked to see that Godzilla and, Gang and Anguirus had disappeared from the board, leaving only Mothra. Face had just fucked me over. N needless to say, I was pissed. But there wasn't anything I could do. And I'm willing to bet that even if I had said yes, I would have been stuck with Mothra anyway. Face giveth and face taketh away. I took a deep breath and got ready to explore. There were two paths I could take through the board. I decided to take the lower one. This turned out to be a good choice for reasons I'll get into momentarily. The first world ahead of me was a, for was a forest. So I started there. Almost immediately, I got an eerie feeling. There was something about this level that just seemed off to me, even more than the previous ones. Perhaps it was the pitch black background. I've always been afraid of being in the forest at night. Something about all those trees 
makes me feel surrounded and vulnerable. And the fact that I was stuck as Mothra didn't help. Playing the game's previous worlds as Godzilla gave me a feeling of bravery. Being in control of the king of mo the monsters. I'd, been able to, I'd be able to handle just about anything in my way. But it's not like that with Mothra. No feeling of strength or security. Now I'm just a weak, overly, e easily overwhelmed bug traversing into the unknown. Back to the level. The music had new instruments, sounding like woodwinds, followed by slow, rhythmic drums and chiming bells. Gave me the feeling that I was intruding into some dangerous place I really should not be. After a while, I encountered the first enemies of the stage. Or at least, I assumed they were enemies. They were strange, long-legged deer creatures. Instead of attacking, they just they were just idly waiting around. I went to approach them, and they ran away. I thought about shooting one with an eye beam to see what would happen, but it seemed wrong. These creatures were harmless. So I passed over them and continued through the level. About halfway through, I encountered a group, groups of the deer-like animals, and also two new creatures, a sloth-like creature with a beak climbing on a tree, and hairy raptor-esque beasts that were preying on the deer. It was very surreal watching these creatures interact. I didn't feel like I was playing a video game, but rather that I was traversing, traveling a world through a forest in some other dimension. The creatures ignored me for the most part, although the raptors did attack me when I got too close or if I attacked them first. I know I shot one of them to help one of the deer creatures escape. I got clawed at, but confrontation was easily avoided by flying up to the top of the screen. After that, I had to choose whether I wanted to play the levels with the hourglass glass, or the TV screen. I picked the latter. What I got was not at all what I expected. When I pressed the button to start the level on the TV screen like I normally would, this screen with an animation popped up. There was also music in the background, which was the goofy Ghidorah music that used to be playing in the quiz levels. I was somewhat unsettled by this because it was just so strange. I also found it a bit spooky because I had a shirt that looked just like that when I was a kid. After starting the animation, you could, you could go back to the board by pressing any button. After that, I had no, I had no idea what to expect of the rest of these icons. I went to try an hourglass icon next. I was somewhat relieved when an actual level came up. It was certainly an unorthodox looking level, all brown with time measuring instruments floating in the air and gigantic grandfather clocks in the background. The music was the same as the board screen. And very early in the level, I encountered something else I didn't expect to see. Original enemies from the game. And not just that, it seemed to be a whole fleet of them. And the yellow tanks, which were normally immobile, could now move. I took some damage, but it was nothing I couldn't handle. But the most interesting thing about this was the colored hourglass items. There were three of them. One, a blue hourglass that made time slow down and 
filled the level with enemies from the past. Two, a red hourglass that made time speed up and filled the level with enemies from the future. Three, a green hourglass that set time to normal speed and filled the level with the original game enemies. I encountered the blue hourglass first. As stated, the game started to slow down. And I saw the enemies from the past, which were five different types of prehistoric animals. I don't know much about prehistory, but I believe all of these enemies represent real animals. The level went into another segment, and I encountered the green hourglass. And then I fought the original enemies again. It was the same five types, so I didn't take any screenshots. But in the last segment, I encountered the red hourglass and the enemies that must have been from the future. Now, whether or not the game was showing me an 8-bit eight, eight renditions of creatures that will actually exist thousands of years into Earth's future, I have no idea. But with that thought in mind, I found this particular segment to be very eerie, and it was made more tense because everything moved faster. One of the future enemies bore a striking resemblance to something I saw in a book once called a Troodon Man. Another looked like some quarter, kind of organic spaceship. There was only one of the fifth type of future creature, and when it appeared, all the others ran for their lives, leaving me alone to battle it. It could fly, but its sprite didn't actually move, and its single attack was firing a lightning bolt from its face. Even so, it was surprisingly powerful, and I suppose it could be considered a mini-boss. After defeating it, it left a health power-up that restored energy, the health and energy I had lost fighting it, which was convenient. It seemed that I would need all the help I could get to beat this world with Mothra alone. After that previous stage, I call Time Warp. The next stage appeared to be in a toxic waste dump. As you can see, the place looked grungy and inhospitable. The music was a short looping of an ambient synthesizer song. Listening to it made me feel like I had just sniffed some toxic fumes myself and it was messing with my head the whole time. I even felt like I was choking while playing the level. The enemies all seemed to be mutated to some degree. In the above screenshot, you can see green mummies with bird skulls and that jump out of the waist and spit projectiles. There's also a brownish cow skeleton a monster with spider legs. Halfway through the level, I even saw one of the deer in the forest. It was alone, and when I saw it, it was drinking toxic waste out of a barrel with an anteater-like tongue. I was moving over to try to make it stop, but then the flock, this flock of skull birds came out of nowhere and started attacking. The deer was scared by this and ended up running off the ground into the toxic waste. I felt bad for it. One of the birds bit me, but I regained health quick from killing all of them. They were rather weak. Pressed onward. Of all the levels in Entropy, this was probably the most normal in that 
there were little de there was little deviance from the move forward smash things formula of the original game. I encountered more creatures through the level, like tentacled blobs and some kind of deformed thing with human like teeth. I didn't feel like provoking them into a fight, so I kept on flying it near to the top of the screen. I still had to deal with the occasional flock of birds now and then. At the end of that level was a large, bluish-green lake. And there I encountered another mini-boss. Some kind of monster with a long neck and a whale skull. It attacks with a mouth projectile and by charging at you. It could also go underneath the water and rapidly emerge from a different place. It was harder to beat than the boss from the time warp. And it had a lot of health, because it must have taken me three minutes to defeat it. It let out a really loud noise when it died, and then sank back into the water as I left the screen. Back on board, back on the board, I went to the nearest icon that I hadn't seen yet, which was a white tree. As I guessed, the level was a winter-themed recolor of the forest stage. But unlike the regular forest, I didn't feel unnerved staring, starting this one. I think the music had a lot to do with it. It was a gentle, calm song. It almost sounded romantic. It was quite stress relieving and the forest itself looked much less ominous covered in snow. I traveled through the first segment, enjoying the atmosphere for four minutes. And then suddenly I realized something. I hadn't seen a single creature since I started the level. Where were all the animals? Soon after I left the screen and the next segment started. In the second segment, I was still in the winter forest, but now the music was gone. I started to feel suspicious, but then I reminded myself that there were other empty levels in the game, and this was likely one of another one of those. But then I heard something familiar. It was the 12 second loop, looping music, from Unforgiving Cold starting up. I could feel my heart sink as I came across this horrible sight. It was a whole group of dead deer creatures, covered in snow. Judging from the blackish blue tone of their skin, they must have all frozen to death. On closer inspection, some were missing body parts. Now I was frightened, but I still had to keep going. Before exiting the level, I was really hoping to see something resembling the previous forest animals in a living state. And sure enough, I did. It was a creature much like the beaked sloth, except this thing had white fur and was more of a beaked gorilla. It was walking very slowly when I saw it, but I was happy to see something alive. 
However, it didn't stay that way for long. A pack of raptors who must have sensed that something else was alive came rushing in from the right side of the scream. The beaked gorilla didn't stand a chance as one of the raptors immediately lunged at it and ripped open its back legs. These winter raptors acted far more different from their temperate relatives. While the other raptors only attacked while hunting prey or when provoked, the winter raptors seemed to have gone all gone insane. They attacked everything on sight. One was running back and forth, clawing at nothing. Even the noises they made sounded different, more high-pitched, and enraged. As I left the second segment, I even saw two raptors fighting to death. They were both covered in injuries, and one of the raptors had been blinded in one eye. I took a screenshot, but I didn't say to see who won the fight. I only had to get through one more segment before I could go back to the board screen. But in this segment, I was no longer in the winter forest, because, but instead a very empty grassy plain with a bright gray moon in the sky. The pleasant music of Winter Forest Part 1 had returned. And immediately, I started to feel dread. This is going to sound crazy, but it's the absolute truth. This game made... The game made this level from one of my memories. After a long stretch of nothing, I reached a lake. And then the moon moved down from the sky and began to hatch like an egg. When it did, a curled up humanoid figure fell into the lake as the moon halves quickly disintegrated. I heard a splash when it hit the water and then a moment of silence. Then the screen began to shake, and a new creature emerged from the water. And thus I was introduced to a monster I call the Moon Beast. This was the only screenshot I took as I was focusing all my concentration on winning the fight, and it was the most difficult fight yet. Stronger than any of the previous bosses, the creature would have been hard to take down with Godzilla and with Mothra, it seemed nearly impossible. I suppose I would consider myself fortunate that the beast lacked any of any attacks like Gigan saw, but because if it had, I would never have won this. I barely had three bars of health when I finally killed the of this abomination. But what happened afterward is hardly what I would call a reward. I've been trying to keep my promise and suppress this memory for years, but it seems that as if I have to get it off my chest. Uh, this is a very painful memory for me, but the game already knows about it, and I, th I think you should too. I'll just tell you the important parts, because I don't like bringing this experience back into my head unless I have to. Back when I was in middle school, I had a girlfriend named Melissa. She suffered from some kind of mental disorder that caused her to go into episodes. When she was in an episode, she would stand or sit perfectly straight or still, and her face would instantly lose any expressions that she had before. She would speak very clearly, without any hint of emotion. 
when it was over, she would start trembling and sometimes bury her face in her hands and remain silent for several minutes. Can't really convey the feeling it gave me in words, and I won't try. You had to see this in person to understand. But despite this, she was a very kind person, and I cared about her dearly. We liked to hang out in the field at night and look at the stars. <laughs> but one night, she didn't say anything to me at all. She just stared directly into the moon, trembling. I tried to talk to her, but she suddenly sprang, sprung up and ran right into traffic. I, I tried to stop her, but it was too late. She got hit by a truck and was killed that night. I looked right into her eyes when the wheels went over her neck. That sight has always haunted me. I know that the game knows about this because after I defeated the moon beast, this happened. Before we continue, you heard me, correct? You're already able to hear me, right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay, I wasn't sure you could hear me. Because I had to bring up my mic real close to me for it to actually pick up my voice. <laughs> so I couldn't tell. Oh. Oh. Oh, my good. Did I scare you? <laughs> Oh, I didn't expect that. I just didn't expect it. <laughs> I told you I had horror acting, so yes, I was good at this. <laughs> it's true. That's true. You did say that. I just didn't. I didn't expect it. That's all. <laughs> I did not expect it. Anyway, back to the story. All. <laughs> all right. Good God. Um, chapter five. Entropy. Part two. After that, it was all I could do not to burst out screaming, and my hands were shaking so bad I could barely hold my, the controller. I knew the game was going to test me if I kept playing, but I had no idea it would go so far or that it was even capable of doing what it just did. I could feel my brain going haywire as I asked myself, did the, did the game just read my mind? That didn't seem possible, but what ex other explanation was there? It was then that I could no longer deny now what now seemed obvious. The game is alive. And not only that, it, it, all, it, it also can establish some kind of mental connection with the player. And yet, I couldn't want to stop playing. I don't know if it was the game messing with my mind or just my stubborn curiosity, but 
even with the previous revelation, I really wanted to see this through to the end. Even more than I did before I beat Dementia. Terrifying as it may be, even dangerous, I knew that if I quit playing, I would never be able to stop thinking about it. If I tried to restart the game, it might go back to normal again. How many people ever got to witness something like this firsthand, let alone be able to take screenshots of the whole thing? Fucked up as it was, this was an experience of a lifetime. But even so, I couldn't take any chances with my health. I had the TV remote right next to me, ready to turn off the TV in case I felt I was in actual danger. And if that didn't work, I would plug it. I would pull the plug out of the wall and just run out of the room. Surely that would be enough. Whatever powers the game has, it seemed to be confined to what it can show on the TV and whatever its mental condition could do. Connection could do. The latter was what worried me. I, I still didn't know what I was dealing with, so I wasn't about to underestimate it. I took a break for a few minutes to calm my nerves. And then it was back to the game. And speaking of TVs, uh, there was a TV screen icon right below the white forest I had just left. And because the first animation was so bizarre, I figured I'd try another to see what happens. Although I expected the same animation, I actually got a totally different one. Weird. The music for this one was the Neptune board music. Fitting, I suppose, since it's a fish man and all. I can't help but wonder what the point of all these things are. There was one more TV screen icon, so I figured it must have had have a unique animation on it of its own. I was going to make sure to see what it was before I left Entropy. Then it was time for another level. The gold brick icon was... The closest thing, so I went to that and I started up a gold labyrinth level. My health and power were refilled. Refilled. I'm not sure how or why, but I was glad not to be heading into the unknown nearly dead. I also noticed that my Mothra sprite had shrunk to half its original size. The music was slow, was a slow, ominous beat with female voice vocals kicking in about a minute into it. Quite haunting. The gold labyrinth itself was an anomaly. I'm not sure how this level would have played out if I was using Godzilla or Angiris. This flying seemed necessary just to get around this place. Another thing that caught my attention was that when you go left, your monster actually turns and faces to the left. This sounds stupidly obvious, but in the original game, you were only supposed to move to the right, so when you tried to move to the left, your monster ended up walking or flying backwards. This level was apparently gigantic in size because every time I thought I had reached to the end of it or thought I was going to end up back where I started, I encountered something totally new, like lava blockades, new enemies, and statue faces. And when I, and I found one statue face at a dead end with a wide open-eyed stare.
the night Melissa died, she had an expression on her face that looked exactly like this the whole time. Even when she got hit by the truck, she she still had that same expression. I can't help but feel like something really is staring at me from behind the screen when I look at this. I really didn't want to be reminded of that night anymore, so I left the statue almost as soon as I found it. I needed to find an exit, the exit anyway, which proved to be no simple task. It felt like this level stretched on forever in all directions. I must have wandered around the level for at least 15 minutes before I finally saw something. It was a creature that wasn't gold, seemingly the only one of its kind in the level, lacking any kind of hover ability like the other creatures. It just walked and back for it just walked back and forth on the platform. But it wasn't long after I found it that a flying machine swooped down and grabbed it and then flew off with it. The machine apparently had not seen me, so I decided to follow it to see where it was taking the creature. The machine stopped at a room with a large cauldron-like object in the center. The machine hovered over to the cauldron and dropped the creature into it. The creature came, emerged from a hole in the cauldron's side, now adorned in the same gold color as everything else. The machine flew off. I'm not really sure what to make of all this, but I'm glad I claim, came upon it because I found the exit soon after. When I got back to the board, I realized that the bosses hadn't moved at all. A bit odd, but it didn't bother me. It made plan planning my route through Entropy easier. There were still two new icons to explore, the Indigo Cliffs and the Black version of the Labyrinth. Since there were only three Labyrinth icons, which were surrounded by bosses, I played the Indigo Cliffs first. It was a lot of the blue-green mountains. The level graphics had the same shredded look to it. There's also a, malt, a recolor of the clouds and moon from the to Toxic Waste Jump. The music, if you can call it that, was nearly a deep rumbling noise. One of the few things I encountered were these multicolored creatures with big heads emerging from a small cave in the ground. They all made a synchronized shaking sound as they, and they walked to the right in a group after emerging from the cave, ignoring me. Having no other way to go, I followed them through the through. I, fo I followed them on their route. More and more emerged from the cave until the group had about a hundred creatures. Eventually, the pathway ended in a cliff. I was shocked to see that upon reaching the cliff, all the creatures began jumping off into the abyss.
I've seen enemies walk off cliffs before, but but I've never seen NPCs commit mass suicide like this. Very unsettling way to start off a level. I continued on, flying over the various strange animals like the one shown here. Another group of multicolored bobbleheads was jumping up and down only to be snatched up by large birds, which I'm fairly certain are sprite versions of the giant condor from Godzilla vs. the Sea Monster. I've defeated some of the condors in battle, but it bothered me that these bobbleheads seemed to be so eager to die. If the game itself is alive, perhaps the creatures in these levels are also alive. And some have very unhappy lives if this behavior is any indication. But what provokes them to do this? In the back of my mind, I'm almost expect that the glowing moon in the sky is the reason. At the end of the level, I saw yet another group of bobbleheads marching up to a large monster and being devoured. This was starting to disgust me, so acting on impulse, I fired off eye beams at both the monster and the bobbleheads. I destroyed the cave. The monster became angry and ran through the remaining bobbleheads to fight me. Although it lacked any ranged attacks, it was relentless. But it was no match for me. I was in the home stretch now, up to the bosses. My plan was to go through Batra first, then Megalon, and after that, I would watch the last TV screen, play the Black Labyrinth before fighting Mechagodzilla, and lastly, go through the chase with the Hell Beast. I was curious to see if it would be in a new form again. But first things first, time to beat up Batra. As I expected, he started off in his larva form. The music was Varan's battle theme. Whenever the game puts in a new Godzilla kaiju with one form or another, that other form always shows up. For a game that's otherwise inexplicable, it's rather startling in its consistency and accuracy with the new kaiju bosses. The fight started off simple. Larval ba Larva Batra fought in a similar fashion as Magu Maguma did, charging back and forth and occasionally firing lightning with its horn. During the fight, I noticed that Matra's combative abilities have been altered in my favor. One, the eye beams did twice as much damage as they did originally. Now they were as strong as Godzilla's punches. The poison power was powder was similarly improved. It also did this nice thing where it would actually hit an enemy when you used it. In the original game, even though Mothra could fly, she was unable to fly over an opponent. You would get knocked back the same way uh, as if you just ran into them, which was extremely annoying. But not anymore. I could change direction and fly around, which was a big help because fighting Imago Bat Batra was much like fighting a clone Mothra, but although Batra is distinctly faster and stronger, no longer impeded by its slow-moving larva form, Imago Batra was a fearsome opponent. Although it lacked the horn lightning, it now had a new, more powerful eye beam. Batra could change direction just like I could, 
So this battle involved a lot of flipping and flying around. It was pretty damn fun, to be honest. So after defeating Batra, I was excited to see what Megalon would be like. But first, I went through an Indigo Cliffs level and shot through a lot of creatures for the health power-ups. So, about Megalon, his music was Gigan's theme. Makes sense, since Gigan was his battle partner in Megalon's one and only film appearance. He was a lot like Mogera, but faster and with more weapons. He starts out by charging off with his drills. I like to fly back and forth around him, which seemed to really annoy him. After a few seconds, he stepped back, turned around, and started spitting out grenades. Those were a pain, because they bounce off. Because they bounce when they hit the ground. Lastly, he started spamming his lightning beam. It only went straight forward, so it was easy to duck under and then shoot him with his eye beams. With eye beams. Overall, I'd describe him as strong, persistent, but dumb. I was now nearing the end of entropy. I had just taken down Megalon. And I started up the last TV screen to see what I'd get this time. The result was unpleasant. The music for this gruesome scene was the password theme. Couldn't figure out why this animation was so sinister and violent in comparison to the other two. This whole game seemed to be growing more malevolent. As I went on to finish Entropy, I began to feel drained. It's hard to describe. Like I had suddenly become tired when I wasn't before. Most likely it was just the tension from all that had, that had happened in the game getting to me, but who knows. The last level type on Entropy is what I call the Shadow Labyrinth. The scenery was recorded from gold to black recolored from gold to black. The music was an um, evil ambiance similar to the unforgiving cold loop, but distinctly different. The music was my first sign that this level was going to be distressing. I traveled through the maze for about a minute and I noticed there weren't any creatures hovering around. It was an odd transmission from transition from the gold labyrinth, which was overrun with creatures, to this level that had nothing at all. But then it might be a good thing. But then this might be a good thing. Maybe there would be wouldn't be any obstacles and I could get through this level with ease. Then the screen went dark. And almost and immediately I snapped out of my daze from a few seconds earlier. Everything had been darkened so that the only thing I could see was the Mothra sprite. I couldn't tell where I was going or 
I ended up frantically running into walls. I heard a noise, the sound of a crowd running through a hallway. And along with the running came the roars. Loud, roaring sounds. Which I would describe as something like a rabid dog the size of an elephant screaming in fury. And I could tell that whatever was making this noise, there were lots of them. I knew there was something there, but I wasn't sure until I did some screen cap editing that I got to see what my pursuers looked like. But at this time, all I, I couldn't see where they were or where I was going. I was literally running blind and, and this mob of beasts eventually caught up with me. All I could think was no, as I saw my life bar rapidly declining. The monsters had taken me down to half of my total health when I was saved. The light came on, and the attackers had disappeared. So the challenge to, of this level was revealed. Find an exit. Find the exit before the lights go out and a pack of monsters maul you to death. I was in panic mode now, moving as fast as I could go while trying every path I could find for a way out. As I played through the level, the lights went out a total of three times. The second time I would have been dead of meat if I hadn't, if it had not been for the wide, one of the wide-eyed statues. As I stayed close to it, the monster seemed to avoid me until the light came out, came back. The statue warded them away somehow. I was safe as long as I stayed near the statue, but at the same time, I had to leave to find the exit. The Shadow Labyrinth turned out to be much smaller than the Gold Labyrinth, as it not only took six minutes, six minutes to navigate to the end, but before the exit, there was a row of halls leading straight down, with no way out once entered. You either got to go to the exit before the monsters reach you, or you died. Thankfully, I made it out. Only one more boss, Mechagodzilla. I started the battle and got something unexpected. Not only did my life shoot back up to 100% again, it seemed to do that randomly, but instead of a replacement boss, I was, I was fighting Godzilla. But any Godzilla fan worth their salt can figure this out. Mega Godzilla started off like fighting a clone Godzilla, but his disguise burned away after only two, only three life bars. Usually, a transformation only occurred at the halfway point. At this point, it was like fighting Mega Godzilla in the normal game. Felt kind of nice to fight one of the original game enemies for a change. Although he wasn't exactly normal, say he also had a rainbow beam and finger missiles. This prevented me from doing the old trick of backing him into a corner and hitting him with eye beams in a spot where he can't hit me, but that was always a cheek trick anyway. But after getting him down to half health, something weird started to happen. His sprite started to glitch in much the same way as Gizaru's had back at the First World. 
After a few seconds, the glitches began to form a new shape. And thus the game had created not Mecha Godzilla. And I discovered that his visual glitch was somehow related to the game recreating things. The human face on this one gives it a very uncanny look. It was on one of the stronger, stronger replacement monsters and had the most firepower. Pictured here is its mouth beam, which I almost got caught in the middle of. Which I got caught in the middle of. Even though it was a bit stronger, it was also slower than its original counterpart and couldn't jump around as much. I won the fight by constantly staying out of its line of fire, bombarding the machine with poison powder as it flew over it. One last thing to do. The Hell Beast Chase. Oh boy. Might as well get this over with, I thought. The entropy and chase ended up being exactly what I was afraid of it would be. A labyrinth level. All the other chases, although difficult, were extremely straightforward. You just had to run to the right and not get touched. But this took all the simplicity out of it. There was no telling how big so that this labyrinth would be, or where the exit was. And now, not only did I have to constantly backtrack to find my way out, I also have to avoid getting one hit by the one hit killed by the red monster. And for those first 30 seconds, it didn't show up. But I knew it would as I started picking up the pace. I heard a loud flapping noise and there it was in a flying form it flew with bat like wings and was as fast and relentless as ever for reasons already stated this was probably the most nerve-wracking of all the end chases and as such i had to keep my focus on the game and not taking screen caps. However, I did take one of the red monster doing something I found very interesting. I had managed to lose it by going through a different path than it apparently expected, and it was blocked from attacking me by one of the organic walls of the red labyrinth. Or so I thought. It tried clawing through the wall for a second before opening up its mouth and tearing the wall apart with the intestine jaws. But those brief milliseconds that the monster was held back might have been the key to finding the exit. The path to exit was long and complex. From what I remember when I went up and then back towards the left, I'm still not sure why I chose those particular ways. Just a lucky hunch, I guess. I suppose. I was sweating profusely, but my, wor but my luck had saved me yet again. I had hoped that it wouldn't run out before I finished the game. There were only two more worlds to go. Next was the penultimate world, called Extus. So that's part two. Holy shit. Um, take a break real quick.
and bright if i remember correctly in this next one i think samson shows up right uh pretty sure i'm pretty sure it's this one because it's right before the end yeah oh solomon my bad yes solomon comes in the next chapter such a fucking badass all right <sighs> okie doke All right. You ready? Yep. Okay, let's do this. Chapter 6. Extus. In the brief instant before the transition between entropy and Extus, I was hoping that I would get Godzilla and Anguirus back. As the board appeared, I saw that my wish was half granted. I had Godzilla back, but no Anguirus. I would have preferred both. But despite Anguirus' neat abilities, I would have chosen Godzilla if I had to pick between the two. Extus had two different color temples, white and pink. A white a pyramid, what looked like some modern buildings, and two icons I couldn't figure out at the time. Their new bosses were Kumonga, Gorosaurus, and not Ghidorah, who I was dreading to see, let alone fight. With Godzilla back, I was expected, I was excited, again, and eager to explore, yet still cautious. I went to the quiz level first, just as before. This time, Face's questions were more random than ever. Quiz four. Question one. Do elephants breathe? Answer, yes. Reaction. Weird face number two. Question two. Have you ever been molested by a family member? Answer, no. Reaction. Weird face number six. Question three. Have you ever raped anyone? Answer, no. Reaction. Weird face number eight. Question four. Is green your favorite color? Answer, no. Reaction, weird face number 10. Number five, question five. Is the computer the pinnacle of modern technology? Answer, yes. Reaction, weird face number four. Question six, are you a tough guy? Answer, yes. Reaction, weird face number 12. Question seven, can you fly? Answer, no. Reaction, weird face number nine. Question eight, can you stand on your head? Answer, yes. Reaction. Weird face number seven. Question nine. Do you hate raccoons? Answer. No. Reaction. Confused. Question ten. Do you feel blame? Answer. No. Reaction. Weird face number eleven. Question 11. Would you like a new monster? Answer, yes. Reaction, surprised. Question 12. Will you miss me? Answer, yes. 
reaction. Sad. I was happy that I was getting a new monster, but that last question bothered me. Will you miss me? Is face referring to when I finished the game, I thought? Since the revelation of the game's truly otherworldly nature, I wasn't sure what to think of face or anything else, but something about that last statement gave me a genuine feeling of sadness from face. As I was thinking about this, the game had gone back to the board. I had a new monster, but I had no idea what it was supposed to be. The sprite had a slight resemblance to Rodan, but the head was totally off. I moved this mysterious newcomer to a white temple icon and started the level. When I started the level, the screen appeared with the text find the gem presumably instructions for beating the level after that i got my first look at my new playable monster a hairy dark blue creature with bat wings and a skull-like face named solomon and also and i also found that my path was blocked by a beam of light and a small pillar with a plate on it. I figured that the beam of light was blocking the exit. So I have to find the gem to drop it on the plate to deactivate the beam. How exactly I was going to do that, I don't know. There wasn't anything in the original game requiring you to find an item to beat a level. I'd have to find out when I obtained the gem. The only direction I had to go was left, and so on I proceeded. So on I proceeded. Solomon was an interesting monster, to say the least. He was capable of both flight and a heat beam, both of which proved to be very useful. He could also kick and slash with his wings, but he couldn't duck. The White Temple's music was a vocalizing choir, or a video game approximation of such. It's hard to describe, but it had a very holy sound to it. It wasn't long before I started running into waves of strange new enemies. They did little to stop me. I ran past them while slashing and didn't take any damage. There was a pause behind each new wave of enemies. After you had killed about ten, there wouldn't be any for about a minute. Then the next wave would appear. After five minutes, I noticed holes in the floor and ceiling. Guillotine-mouthed creatures were rapidly flying up and down the crevices. So I had to time my jumps carefully because I didn't know if I'd get another shot at this. Luckily, I managed to get through without a scratch. I'm just lucky, I guess. After that, I found myself at the end of a hallway, facing some kind of mini-boss monster. It moved fast, and it had some projectile that it shot in four directions, but I killed it quite easily using Solomon's heat beam. When the battle was over, I had my gem, which was inside the creature's head. I found that I could pick up and hold the gem by walking over to it and holding down B. I made the long trek back to the start, deposited the gem on the plate, which deactivated the beam. I left the sage and was shown what was probably the strangest quirk relating to the Solomon monster. 
every time you complete the stage or defeat a boss with Solomon, this screen appears. I have no idea what still the best 1973 means. Neither did the date nor the phrase have any meaning or significance to me that I can think of, and I've spent a lot of time thinking about it. The next level I played was the one that I call Bronze Pyramid. I used Godzilla and found that he had been leveled up to 12 since I last played him in Dementia. The Bronze Pyramids were fairly normal as far as levels go, but the visuals were quite interesting. Almost unusually colorful and lively. The music had a fittingly Egyptian style to it. It was a slow and mysterious sounding. I strolled through the level fighting off various enemies and none were too difficult, although the ants could be a pain if you ran across, ran into too many at once. My favorite enemy was this giant reptile I encountered about halfway through. the end of the level, I came to a pyramid and I engaged in yet another mini-boss fight. Although this one was a bit different because I had to fight two of these monsters at the same time. Individually, I could have dealt with them easily, but fighting both of them at once was challenging but I sped things up by tricking one of the twin beasts into barbecuing his brother by jumping when he used the flame breath. After defeating the twin monsters, I noticed something strange after returning to the board. I was now able to move my monster piece anywhere on the board without limits. Normally, Godzilla could only move three spaces each turn, and Mothra could move five. I wanted to try out Solomon some more, so I moved his piece to one of the brown pillars, looking icons with colored dots, and started the level. When I got to the level, I then realized what the level icon represented. Totem poles. I was greeted by two of them right at the beginning. The music had a Native American sound to it. It seemed to be using the same instruments as, entropy, as the Entropy Forest. It was noticeably different, but just as foreboding. I walked around for three minutes with nothing else in sight besides the totem poles. I didn't realize it until then, but I was expecting another level of with nothing alive in it. After all the activity and entropy, walking around all those multicolored faces, this unnerving level hit me, left me feeling like I was being watched. Only about 10 minutes after I started Extus, I was already halfway through. After getting back from the totem pole level, I tried out one of the TV screens to see how strange they were this time. Even more strange than before, apparently. The music for this was the Uranus theme. I switched back to Godzilla to play another level. This level was quite a surprise. It was a normal city level. The colors were gloomy, but even still, this was quite a shock. This was the kind of level I would expect to see in a Godzilla game, and 
I was kind of mad that I didn't get to play it earlier. The music was the Earth theme. I found it strange that a level fitting in a Godzilla game would show up this late. But there's no point crying over spilled milk. I suppose. I moved Solomon to a grayish green icon that which turned out to be a high-tech lab laboratory of some sort. Lots of mechanical drones in this level. But Solomon cleared the, through them just like the White Temple enemies. The music was a gritty industrial beat. There was also a strange flying cyborg enemy, which was annoying because... It would fly away when you jump to attack it. Also of interest were these large stasis tanks holding some kind of monster inside. As you would guess, sometimes the monsters awaken and shatter through the glass. I tried to get past the stasis tanks as far as possible, but because the monsters inside proved to be vicious little bastards and upon release. At the end of the level was an elevator, which I used to go down to the bottom of the level where the exit was. Along the way, I was shot at by security drones. I couldn't leave my elevator, so my only defense was the heat beam. The last level type was this simple thing I called the Heart Temple for obvious reasons. Nothing but a big hallway filled with floating enemies like shaped like human hearts. They're incapable of causing you damage. So what you do is run through the level, smashing as many as you can to get all the power-ups. One run through these levels would get you, would get the life meter back up to full, and I would greatly appreciate these levels later. The Hearts Temple music reminded me of a circus tune. It had an overly chill for sound to it, which gave the level a really weird feeling. Having seen all the level types, I chose to fight Gorosaurus using Solomon. The music for this fight was Gizarus theme. It was during the fight that I realized that Solomon is overpowered. A single well-aimed slash can take down as many as four of the enemy's life bars. Due to this, the match was over very quickly. Gorosaurus had no projectile attacks or anything else that can match Solomon's deadly claws. But I kept the fight going just long enough to see if Gorosaurus would use his iconic kangaroo kick. And I was greatly pleased when he did. Even though I knew Solomon, Solomon was my fighting ace, I used Godzilla to battle Kamunga just for variety. I briefly considered using Mothra, but of course Godzilla won out. Kamunga was also a simple opponent, no heat beams or anything. He attacks you by jumping on you, stabbing with his mandibles and also using his signature webbing stream to paralyze you. Once you get webbed, Kamunga will sometimes take the opportunity to attack, but it's mostly just a way to buy some time, like Gizara backing you up to a corner until the time runs out, to the, into the corner until the time runs out. His music was Heatera's theme. With Gorosaurus and Kamunga defeated, I was at the end of Extus. Before I fought Not Gadira, 
Ghidorah. There was something I had to do. I wasn't expecting much from it, but for documentation's sake, I took another look at I took a look at the other TV screen. This is what it was. I I I don't think there ever was much reason behind the TV screens. If I were to guess, I'd say it's some random uncontrolled manifestation of the cartridge's abilities, or maybe all this makes perfect sense to the game. Who knows? Anyway, Mr. Fawcett's theme was the Saturn music. It was time for the opponent that I had been treading. Not Ghidorah. Although I'd gained courage with Solomon's combat advantages, I was still nervous. And when the fight started, I was immediately confused. My opponent was not Gizera. I defeated the imposter with a few strikes and then not Megara appeared. Did it... Did it... It didn't make sense. In order to not to get... In order to get to not, not Ghidorah, I had to battle the previous replacements first. And to battle them, I did... I tore my way through every single one of them until I finally made it to Nat Gadira, who was a Dorad. <laughs> once, once I stopped laughing, I destroyed him with only two slashes. The music stopped and I thought I was going to go back to the board, but the battle wasn't over yet. The real fight was against the Chimera. A monstrous hybrid of all the replacement beasts. This was by far the most difficult boss yet. Every attack of his would cut down whole life bars per use, while attacks against him were greatly weakened. Solomon Slash, for example, was now lucky to take away one half a bar life. During the battle, I gained a great appreciation for two things. The boss fight time limit and the heart temple. Had it not been for those things, I might never have beaten this boss. Take down this behemoth, I came up with a strategy. I would switch between Godzilla and Solomon as one began to get dangerously low on health, I would take them through the Heart Temple while fighting Chimera with the other. I should count my blessings that Chimera couldn't regain lost health. A very interesting thing about Chimera was that the colored sections on his body corresponded to his different body parts. So each body part effectively had its own life meter. The head was invincible as long as it was as the other parts were present. And would always be the last part to be destroyed. In addition to being difficult, it was the longest fight so far. I tried to, rem to remember how many times I got taken out of the fight by this time, but I had lost count around 13. Eventually, I had destroyed all components but the head, which now flew around on its, uh, on its own with an incredible speed. Chimera fought well, but I was extremely determined once he had reduced to a head, he was no longer the had the power to defeat Solomon. When I heat 
and I heat beam beamed him into oblivion. And then the chimera was no more. <sighs> I was exhausted after the fight. After that drawn out fight. And worried that it might affect my performance in the and world chase level. The headquarters icon was replaced. But not by the hell beast face. Instead, it was a crucifix. I was completely stunned. I, I wasn't excited about seeing the Hell Beast icon again, but if there was one, only one good thing about these levels, that's, it's that they were predictable. I had a basic idea of what to expect, but now... Now, here I was at the end, and the icon was completely different. What did it mean? And, and why a crucifix? It made me very uneasy. I attempted to start the level with Solomon, but couldn't. I got, a, I got this notice that simply stated... Solomon can't enter here. It didn't say why, but I think it, maybe it has to do with Solomon's demonic appearance. Since Solomon was out of the question, I went with Godzilla instead. Once I saw the level, the crucifix made sense. The level was a graveyard. I was still on edge, thinking that this was some kind of trick. The last level had always involved running from the demonic beast, but I wasn't going to be fooled into thinking this would be any different. So I started running, but after a minute without interruption, I, I slowed down. It was during this time that the music caught my attention. I knew it sounded familiar when I first heard it, but it took a while before I realized what it was. An 8-bit rendition of Prayer for Peace from the first Godzilla movie. A very sad, powerful song, even in this form. After two minutes into the level, I encountered something that I, I wasn't sure how to react to. My first instinct was to run, but this blue statue-esque being simply floated in place. And I felt just compelled to stare at it for a time. Since this was a grave and it was floating over a chapel, I, I guess that this was some kind of angel watching over the deceased. It gave me a strange but warm feeling. I wouldn't say happy, but... But I felt that I was at peace. Somehow. I had never seen this thing before, and yet it seemed very familiar to me. Just as I was going to leave, the Hell Beast appeared, and its presence warped the music into a terrifying discordance, screeching, screeching, and transformed the level, desecrating the tombs as a new ground appeared, comprised of blood-soaked bodies.
I could feel my heart now beating out of control. I had no chance to escape with a monster that close. It lunged in for the kill, but the angel got in the way. The demon started, roared, and started clawing through the angel's leg. Tears of blood streamed from its eyes. I wanted to save the angel, but there was nothing I could do. I had honored sacrifice and run. And so I ran through the hellish landscape as fast as I could. The beast soon caught up with me, still swallowing the body of the angel whose legs it had torn off. And this height made my terror change to anger. I found, now found myself hating this horrible monster. There was no doubt in my mind that it was pure evil, and I wanted it to die. When I got to the end, I remember how I, respond, I responded to it, how it responded to my insult and trance. I spoke to it and said, You're going to pay. This was its response. I had no idea. <laughs> no idea how I'd follow up to that threat. And nothing could have prepared me for the horrors of the final world. Zenith. Chapter 7 Zenith And here we are at the final world. I don't like to discuss this part, and it still bothers me very much, but it's something I have to do so that I can put this behind me. People deserve to know. At this point, I was well aware of the game's unnatural nature, but... Zenith was different than the other worlds. While the others were certainly strange and sometimes frightening, the world of Zenith was like a nightmare. And I didn't have to go any further than the board screen for an indication that something was wrong with Zenith. The first thing I noticed was the blood red texture of the board and the music, which was an eerie whistling tune. I noticed that I had Solomon and Angiris back, and I felt better for a second. Then I scrolled over to the right to see who my next enemies would be this time. This time, it was Destroya and Ghidorah, Ghidorah. But judging from the icon, it was a different Ghidorah than the original. Standing on the ground instead of flying. The grotesquely detailed pinkish-red icon also caught my eye. I could tell what it was supposed to be, and I was afraid to find out. Going back to my side of the board... I decided that there wasn't much of a choice but to do my usual routine and going to the quiz level before doing anything else. I was not ready for what happened. I jumped back when this first appeared accompanied by a terribly distorted vision of the password theme. It looked at his, as if face had fallen victim to some terrible glitch. Is this what he meant? But will you miss me? Did he know this would happen?
My thoughts were stopped short when I noticed the screen was glitching and seeming to fall apart while I was inactive. So I quickly rushed out. <sighs> and when I got back to the board, it, I somehow had a new monster. I, I hadn't even been asked if I wanted one. I, I tried to select it. And if this happened, No. What the hell is going on? The game's behavior was scaring me. And I hadn't even started the levels yet. I, I couldn't understand why I was randomly given a new character, and, but then denied use of it. Before the time being, there was little that could be done and I viewed the last TV screen no animation no music just dead every instinct I had was telling me to stop playing to just turn the game off and something in the game itself might have been trying to warn me as to just how horrible this last world was. But, but then every stretch of the way, I was compelled to give up. I, I couldn't do that now on the last world. Besides, after taunting me with memories of Melissa, I felt this game owed me some answers. I noticed that the first level was a red temple. So at least I would be familiar with the level graphics, if nothing else. And I went in with Godzilla, the monster I'm most familiar with. Godzilla had been shrunk. The level in score meters had vanished and the blue temple faces were back the music was similar to the blue temple also strange haunting vocalization i tried to get my spirits up by thinking well if this level is like the blue level blue temple then it might mean there are no monsters to deal with how wrong I was. After a short walk, all the statue eyes started glowing and a pack of the beasts from Shadow Labyrinth came charging at me. Since they were coming from the right side of the screen, I had to fight my way through them. The battle greatly tested my reflexes, but Thanks to my speed, I plowed through the beasts. They gave off health power-ups after dying, which helped recover the damage they had given me. However, as I continued through the hallway, the statue's eyes glowed again, summoning another wave. It seemed to be the same number of them, but I was less prepared this time and took more damage. I had gone through four of these waves until I reached the end of the hall where I heat beamed the last of the monsters over the edge of the abyss. At first, it seemed as though I'd reached a dead end, but after the statue's eyes stopped glowing, a brick path appeared before me. I followed the path, which kept me moving towards the right until it stopped at a wall. 
where I was to go vertically by jumping up ledges. Along the way, I had encountered new creatures and some sort of strange shrine, which I had a statue of the Hell Beast and some other creature I didn't recognize. As I went through, the path took a downward direction. I had to carefully aim my jumps to avoid the enemies, which were plentiful in this part of the stage. They didn't have many attacks, but they could easily shove you over the plat off the edge of the platform. At the end of this tunnel, there were a few small platforms floating above nothingness. I landed on one towards the left of the screen. And then something came down from above. It looked like the blue angel from the graveyard, except now it was red, had a skull face. Any of the pleasant feelings I had from the blue angel were not present with this red one. And as it hovered around, its eye sockets started glowing just like the statue, summoning monsters to attack me. Surely this was not the benevolent thing I encountered before. This must be some kind of imposter. The battle was nerve-wracking. And I started off with nearly half my health and had to go deal with multiple opponents as well as the threat of gravity. To make things worse, as the Red Angel took damage, some of the panels fell until only three remained. But my luck had not ran out yet. Just when I thought it was over, I struck the angel, Red Angel one more time, and it turned out one last hit was all it could take. Just as the Red Angel completely disintegrated, the game instantly went back to the zenith board. I moved Mothra over to the nearest stage from the Red Temple, which seemed to be a garbled mess of the letters spelling KILL and began playing. As suspected, all of the level graphics were made of jumbled letters, and Mothra, just like Godzilla, were shrunk to half size. I began to suspect that all of the Zenith levels would be like this. The background music was terrible, as if someone put all the sounds the NES and NES was capable of making into a blender and then piecing them back together into a song. I had to turn the volume down because of it. Playing as Mothra made avoiding the enemies easier, but they were nonetheless determined to get at me. The first enemies were I saw were headless guy games. And later on, there were hybrid monsters pieced together from previous bosses, like the bio anti headed thing seen above. Five minutes had gone by. I didn't see anything new. And the level shifted into another segment. The music changed from the loud and annoying beeps into something far more ambient and menacing. The level graphics also changed, now looking like a blood drenched junkyard. The way everything in this level was red made it sickening to look at. The enemies multiplied in number never ceasing to follow after me. It became harder and harder to avoid. And at the end of the level, the situation reached a climax. As swarms of the monsters fused into one enormous, terrifying hybrid. 
once I had gotten through the initial so shock, I discovered the way of to destroy this thing, constantly shooting eye beams at the Hedora cluster that formed its heads. If you attacked anywhere else, it would regenerate the damage. Even with that knowledge, this was an extremely difficult fight. I'd say it was as hard as fighting the Moon Beast was, if not harder. Its most common attack was lunging forward with its arms covered in Gigant saws and blades, and if they touched, they would instantly drain health. When it was over, the remaining monsters collapsed in a heap. Then they got on the ground, and then they and the ground below them started to disintegrate and sink towards the bottom of the screen. When I came back to the board, I thought to myself, so far, the game's been putting the easiest levels first. If this is the case, how bad will the rest of Zenith be? We're two levels down and three to go. My monster is, and I had taken our foothold in the world of nightmares that was Zenith. Just by what action? to take next, deciding what action to take next was more tense and difficult than before. But ultimately, I had no way of knowing what the next levels would be like, or how well my monsters would be prepared for them. So my only opinion was to guess. I tried to interpret what the icons of the next level was ahead of me were. The last level before the boss battles was obviously representing some type of volcano, volcanic area with lava and open flames. The middle icon I still didn't get except that it looked fleshy and vaguely organ, like an organ of some kind, oddly oversized as well. As well. The one I was nearest to and about the to enter next looked like thorny vines covered in covering in a puddle of blood. I guess this would be the one with blood rivers that like the chase level in dementia. As such I went down there with I went with Angiris. Because due to his rolling move he would have the fastest speed while submerged. This level, which I call Blood Lake, looked as I expected. Rivers of blood accompanied by thorn-covered vines, which scattered all along the sides of the ground. The music was rather faint, but I could hear a distinct drum beat. Underwater. Oh, well. And a few other, uh, I can hear a distinctive drum beat, and a few other instruments, a lot of echoes, and sometimes it sounded like someone was hitting a drum underwater. I was disappointed to see that Angiris had shrunk just as Godzilla and Mothra had, and apparently the Zenith levels, apparently all the Zenith levels, Zenith levels would be like this. I was disappointed to see the Angiris, which, yeah, I felt less secure with my giant monsters no longer so giant. I walked along without uh, interruption for only a minute until my path reached a dead end. There was a massive gap between the ground I was walking on and the ground to the right side of the screen. I would have Sam across and it, uh, I would have continued walking to the right with a huge mass of brambles in the way. There was nowhere to go. Two creatures with gliding membranes on their arms and 
lamprey like mouths were perched on ostrich vines and screeching at me, much like a crow does to an invader of its territory. Another unnerving display, possible sentience by these creatures of the game. If, if it's even accurate to refer, to refer them as being part of the game, that is. I descended into the blood, slowly sinking to the floor. Aquatic animals were everywhere, and they were hard to avoid. The black shark in particular was very aggressive and hard to deal with, but thankfully I only encountered it once. As the screen became more and more crowded, I swam up to the surface to find what was littered, find that it was littered with floating corpses. Creepy, but at least that's not a threat. Or so I thought. Until they sprang out to life and leaped on me. They were trying to pull me under and they were draining my health as they did it. They all attacked as a group, and when I got one off of me, another one would jump on me from behind. I had to curl up into a ball and roll for them to get loose, to loosen their grip. And when they did, I qu quickly retreated. It wasn't long before I had reached another land path. I know regarding the brambles, you could stand on them, but it causes pain, and you also don't want to destroy some of the vines, but only the thinner ones. I destroy multiple vines as well as dealing with more enemies. I was interrupted by a screen. The screen was about was up for about, oh, 30 seconds. Then it went back to the level. I was facing another dead end and a pregnant humanoid creature being hanged from the top right of the screen by a spinal umbilical cord. A niche instantly. The creature's belly was split open from the inside. And as the lower part of its body was ripped apart and fell into the river below, the blood lake's boss was revealed. came flying towards me, making a shrill, hacking scream. I was forced to move back. The bat was highly mobile boss, fast and difficult to hit. As I moved back along the ground, the monster opened its mouth and shot it up a barrage, a barrage of needles. I jumped over them and managed to give it a blow to the head, and it started flying out of my reach. As the bat was flying, it shot a stream of fire from its eye sockets. I rolled on the ground, which drained my power, but put us at equal speed. This cycle repeated around three times until the monster was defeated. With most of my health drained, I went back to the edge of the level, and with the large bramble vine blocking the exit, was now gone. Now only two levels left to go. 
Who to send this time? Godzilla, Mothra, and Anguirus had all completed one level, leaving Solomon. Also the mysterious fifth monster. I tried again to access it, but with no luck. I chose to use Godzilla again for the next level and Solomon for the final one. The second to last level was what I referred to as the organic level. It was the most, which was the most physically, visually unpleasant of them all. Right from the start, I could see that the graphics were freakishly different. The atmosphere was so gruesome and foreboding. Right from the start, I could see that the graphics were freakishly different. The atmosphere was gruesome and foreboding with the addition of the loud droning music. I was dreading what I would see in these levels and it was only a few seconds before something appeared. Two hideous uh, things. It's hard to describe what m most of this level, even everything has a disturbing semi-real look to it. Most of the monsters look halfway between real monsters and misshapen lumps of gore with teeth. It's also worth noting that all of them were considerably larger than Godzilla, and all of the majority were not very intelligent. Each of them took around 30 plus hits to kill. Due to this, it was a better idea to run away from them than fight, but it was never clear exactly what the direction to run me to. To run, and, to run to. While most levels involve going to the right to get the access, the path of this level is primarily going down by walking to the edge of one platform and jumping down to a lower one. There was no way to make sure that you were going the right way, nor any apparent means of getting back up to the higher platform, if necessary. There's no way to make sure you were getting back to the going the right way, nor, nor any apparent means of getting back up to higher platforms, if necessary. Also, certain enemies acted as if they were aware you had to jump down and would stand at the edge of a lower platform waiting for you. When this happened, I would have to walk back and wait until the monster would leave. As I went on, I came across platforms stacked above each other with little space in between, looking like a maze. This meant that I couldn't jump, and it made escape from enemies difficult. Thankfully, the only enemies able to fit through these mazes were the four-legged beasts I had seen at the beginning of the level. Adding to the difficulty were long tapeworm-esque monsters that would rise themselves between the platforms and trap you. The only thing they responded to was the heat beam, which would cause them to shrink back down, but the, this was costing even more power. And I couldn't afford to do without the heat beam for long. While trying to avoid the abominations that dwell in this level, 
I found out that if you stand idle for one place for too long, the crown tries to absorb your monster. I think it was about four minutes before the end that this level is was making me physically sick. The tension was getting to me and having to take all taking all these disgusting sights made me want to puke. I nearly did pause the game and look for a bag, but I was able to hold it together. I found also a trick at the end of the level that it was too late for me to do and a real good. But if two different species of monster run into each other face to face, then they would fight each other and leave me alone. I didn't intentionally cause this, it just happened. Finally, at the end, that it was time for another boss fight. It was certainly ugly, but not quite as horrific as I feared it would be. But more important than dealing with the appearance of defeating it, with, with its appearance was defeating it. And since I had less than half my bar to start with, there was no room for errors. It was attached to the floor when I first saw it, but after 10 fit hits, it detached to the floor and began floating. It moved fast, but unlike the Blood Lakes boss, it, he'll, he wasn't impeded by any sort of gravity. It was even able to fly through the ground without collision event. Without any collision effect. It used this to its advantage, it was, it would float between, uh, beneath the ground and the spring and spring up and randomly bite it to bite you. But it stopped doing this after a few well-aimed kicks to the face. The pink area on its upper jaws was a weak point too. Many hits would cause them to spasm uncontrollably. The new strategy was rapidly was to rapidly float up and down while moving back and forth across her age. Health was getting crucial at this point, and I spammed the heat wave, which from which it had no defense. And the last stretch of this battle, the monster rapidly rushing back and forth and gnashing its jaws. I had to duck under it and then strike when its back was turned. 20 more hits and it was destroyed. And it was on to one last level. I didn't hesitate. I selected Solomon and entered. Perhaps a little too fast. This last level was definitely the peak of disconnect between what the NAS was graphically capable of and what this game could create. The music also caught my attention. It was one of the only songs that appeared more than once. The, the horrible screeching from what the hell beast from when the Hell Beast appeared in the graveyard. And as soon as I started, the, there was already an enemy prepared to attack. A centaur wielding a whip. And it wasn't alone. When I started fighting, several more centaurs appeared. from both sides of the scream at the same time. It was too much to handle. Solomon's flight saved me from taking too much damage at the start of the level. The centaurs followed him, but seemed unable to be unable to jump. After escaping the centaurs, I noticed gaps in the ground.
Yeah, if the, while trying to avoid the jumping sword mouthed enemies in mid flight, I got close to the surface of the lava, and a creature emerged and tried to grab me. But it didn't succeed, but I was startled. Careful maneuvering would be needed here to avoid instant death. As new enemies appeared, the level soon became very difficult. A lot of the trouble came from stocky red demons that stood on top of tall, narrow mountains and spewed fire. I got them by waiting until their back was turned and then hitting them with a flying kip, which made them fall, fall off the lava. It was at this time that I noticed that I wasn't gaining any health from killing enemies. Not at all. The ground was... Not all the ground was stable. At one point, the ground was reduced to small chunks that slowly drifted towards the right. Some of them would sink to the lava upon repeating, upon uh, landing on them. And there was no way they could tell which ones would sink and which ones would not. Being close to the lava added the threat of the lava creatures, and this was very frustrating. I was also feeling hot, which made concentrating hard. If you ever had a feet, heat rash, it felt similar to that. I had to periodically stop for water because of it. This was almost certainly due to the game and not my imagination, but I kept pushing through the thought out of my head. I didn't want to think about it. At the end of the stage, I encountered the boss rising from the lava. Its arrival noted with a godly, unhowling roar. When it walked onto the land, I could saw how gigantic it was. Several times the size of Solomon. I was about to fly up and attack it when it opened its mouth and let out a huge blast of fire. I had to fly to dodge the flames and then get close enough to the boss to fire a heat beam at its face, causing it to stumble backward. If it didn't stumble backward, it would have kept moving left until it was forced Solomon into the lava and as there was no more guard within reach. The beast had to wait between uses of its fire breath, and it seemed to cost a great deal of energy. I used this time to attack it, but fire wasn't the only weapon, and I had to be wary of the monster swatting at me with its clawed hands. Its health decreased, it moved faster, and the battle felt like a tug of war between two monsters over the, this bridge of land. After about 40 hits, it was defeated, tumbling backwards into the lava from whence it came. And then the final stage had been completed. At last, it was down to two bosses and a final encounter with the Hell Beast. For some reason, I thought Ghidorah would be easier, so I confronted him first. The classic Ghidorah battle music from the original started up when I was faced with a new King Ghidorah. King Ghidorah was as powerful and unrelenting as ever. He instantly lashed out with gravity beams which were damaging, more damaging than Godzilla's heat beam. It became a struggle of constantly beating Ghidorah at every opportunity to keep him from using the attack. Oh, Ghidorah saw soon that 
and my tactic. I started using physical attacks as well. He was striking with each of the necks, knocking me backward and making it impossible to get close enough to punch him, but I had an idea to wait for him to lung his way out and then heads out. Wait for him to lunge with one of the heads and immediately blast it with a heat beam. It worked, and to my surprise, the heat beam actually obliterated Ghidorah's middle head. It was only a few seconds before I realized what this led to, and sure enough, King Ghidorah was using the power of the glitch to transform into Mecha King Ghidorah. But what really shocked me was the sudden change in music. I had heard it before, but it wasn't the original NES game. It was from the game Super Godzilla during the Mecha King Ghidorah fight. Mecha King Ghidorah's first attack was its most deadly, the Machine Hand. Very similar to Gigan saw, it immobilizes the monster and rapidly drains its health, the health bar. Fortunately, before King Ghidorah could do a lot of damage, the timer ran out. I would need to defeat Mecha King God, uh, Ghidorah, Mecha King Ghidorah, quickly to prevent him from using the mecha machine time. So I sent Sol uh, Solomon to fight him. The two monsters were evenly matched in strength. When G with Ghidorah defeated, I returned to the baseball. Uh, I, retur I returned to the board. I now outnumbered the enemy by four monsters to one, and victory seemed soon at hand. The base icon had changed to a blood red color. I could feel hatred emanating from it. It started with the fight with Destroya and Angiris, and the music was the same as Ghidorah's. When the fight began, Destroya was in microscopic mode. After one hit, it changed to the Juvenile, which had few attacks. I was also deadly with, uh, I was also dealt with easily. Their fight became serious once Destroy entered his aggregate form, gaining the use of large arms and micro-oxygen beam. Angiris' roll attack, which had been useful up till now, was rendered useless by Destroy constantly attacking me with his large arms when I tried to use it. For this part, I had to really rely on brute strength. Just before the time ran out, Destroy had changed to his flying form, which Angiris was ill suited to fight against. Going against him, I fought, going back in, and I fought the flying form with King Mothra before. Mothra was weaker than Angiris, but was much better equipped to dodge the encounter of flying Destroyer's attacks. So the fight was in my favor. However, the Mecha Ghidorah fight started playing and Destroyer's changed to his final form sooner than I expected, which drastically turned the tables. Mothra's attacks were doing very little to Destroyer. I had to move fiercely to avoid damage while waiting for the timer to run out. Even though it would be near impossible to beat Destroy with Mothra, I had, still had three other monsters. Final form Destroy was very resilient to taking damage, and the heavily armored foe would not be so defeated without a long foe. Or without a long fight. In the last part of the fight, I wasn't using much strategy, just attacking as brutally and as fast as I could. On the last bar of health, Destroyer tried one last counterattack, a beam of energy from his chest. I don't know how powerful it would have been because 
just before it could fire, I punched destroy in the chest cavity, destroying it. And then that was it. The last kaiju boss was gone. In the midst of all the excitement, I had briefly forgotten that there was still one last thing to do before the game was over. Seeing the icon again hit me like a ton of bricks, and I froze for a few minutes. I'd come so far to get this to this point, but I was terrified. I really did not want to know what this last encounter was going to be like before I could let myself think about it any longer. I moved Godzilla over and began the stage. You're here now. This is the end. Just one last thing and then it's all over. And when the screen changed, there was nothing. Just Godzilla on a black screen. I walked back and forth. Fired a heat beam. Nothing happened. Until I heard something. The faint sound of a familiar drum beat. chapter seven so this next one this next one will be the the finale so penguin and bright if y'all are ready yep I'm sure you only yep. i'm pretty sure yeah i'm pretty sure you only have one line to do so which is good but yeah, no, this is, yeah, this is where shit gets, this is the big one, this is the big one. All right. Chapter eight, finale part one. Oh dear God. This was my first thought on realizing that I would have to fight Red, the creature that tormented me through nearly the whole game. How would I be able, to be able to be fight something that can kill me with one touch? It seemed totally impossible. Thankfully, Red was no longer able to deliver one hit kills. But despite that, this is the most, still the most difficult battle I've ever faced in this game or otherwise. If I had any real comprehension, comprehension of what was what I was getting myself into before I started the fight, I never would have done it. I very soon learned what a horrible mistake I had made. Red reached out and clawed at Godzilla. And when those claws cut through him, I felt it. I, I know it's not, I know that it's common for people to cringe up when they're video game characters get hit or lose a life, but this was not that. This was genuine physical pain. When the, when the pain struck me, I paused the game. I hadn't suffered any actual injury, but it felt like my shoulder had just been clawed through. I'd seen and experienced many unpleasant things at this point, but but the game causing me real pain was where I drew the line. Yes, I, I would be disappointed that I wouldn't get to see the ending, but the risk was no longer worth it. I was about to get up and take one last screenshot and turn off the NES when I realized something else. I couldn't get up.
I was paralyzed to my seat. The only muscles I could move were my fingers and thumbs. As the terror set in, a new message appeared on the screen. I started to scream, but only a weak choking sound was coming out. I desperately tried to get my body to move, but it, it did nothing. I was looking every direction, and then I looked over at the computer. Somehow the computer screen was taking screenshots of the game on its own when I began the fight. I still don't know how or why. Something in the game. Must have been causing it. Since Red could hear what I was saying, I tried begging him to let me go. From here, things start to get hazy as I was under extreme stress at the time. But from what I could remember, I said, I I'm sorry. I I'm sorry I, I insulted you. I, you I, I, I didn't mean it. I, I didn't, th I didn't, th I didn't know things would get this serious. Please just let me go. Let's just let me go, yo. Uh, if you let me go, I promise I will never tell anyone. I, 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 I turn on the game ever again. Please, please. And Red replied. Only one will survive. The statement could not be any more clear. If I couldn't kill Red, then he would kill me. Like an idiot, I had played around with something I didn't understand, and now, now it might cost me my life. I stopped struggling to move and accepted the reality of the situation. There was only one way to get out of this alive. I had to kill Red. It all went by so fast. If it weren't for the screenshots, I might not have remembered any of this. Just like in the chase level, Red moved at a horrifyingly fast speed. There was barely enough time to process a thought. And thus, there was no time to form a strategy. I had to rely solely on my wits and reflexes. To make things worse, there was no way to predict what kind of attacks Red might use. So I constantly had to be on the offensive and defensive. I felt every hit that Godzilla took. They all hurt. I tried so hard to avoid the damage, but every attack that I dodged left me vulnerable to another, and the pain would only get worse. After he jumped over me, Red's eyes started to glow. I moved back as far as I could and ducked. But there was no dodging this one. When this hit me, I really did scream. I screamed so loud that someone else in the apartment should have heard me, but they didn't. Just looking at this image hurt, hurts me. Making me remember the incinerating pain. I paused the game because it hurt so bad. But Red unpaused the game to attack me again. Which Red, which made me furious. I immediately counterattacked with the heat beam again and again until the power meter was totally diminished. I wanted Red to hurt like I did. Just before the timer ran out, 
Red transitioned into his swimming form. I didn't think the timer would still be affecting a battle like this, but I'm thankful for it. Because it gave me a few minutes to collect my thoughts and decide what to do next. I chose to fight Red's two next two forms with the monsters I had encountered them with. So I, so Anguirus was next. It probably wasn't all that smart of an idea, but that's what I did. I jumped up and heat beamed Red in the face, and he moved off screen where I couldn't reach him. And then a wave of large mines started to fall from above. I felt that this was unfair, so I shouted, If you're going to cheat, then why do you even let me use the controller? And then he came at me, rushing from the top left to the screen downwards. Gah, damn it! Now I wouldn't be able to see where the next attack was coming from. Red continued to strike from different angles. I constantly moved to swerve around him. Another 40 seconds went by, and Angiris was nearly gone. But together we had forced Red into his flying form. So it was Mothra's turn next. Deciding to fight Red with Mothra was a terrible idea. Mothra was instantly overwhelmed by Red, and the life meter was devastated in a mere 15 seconds. And once Mothra's life was down to two bars, Red did something I did not see coming. He reached out, grabbed Mothra, and ate her. After Mothra was devoured, I, I felt an agonizing pain. Like being crushed to death. Mm. Mothra had been killed for my stupidity and I would share the pain. It was a short transition from the battle to the board, but it felt like an hour. The pain combined with being unable to move was driving me insane. I wanted so badly for this to end. I never wanted anything so much. But I... I still had hope. There was only one monster left that could be brought to full health. By engaging Red in battle, Solomon, if any of them had a chance to save my life now, it would be him. Solomon apparently had history with Red, as when the fight started, this dialogue happened. I'd rather die than serve you. Red took me by surprise again by immediately burning me with his demonic fire a second time. As much as it hurt, it actually worked to my advantage. Since Solomon started at full life, he still had some to spare. But now Red had used up all his energy and could not use his ultimate weapon any longer. Now he would die. As he drew close to the end of his life bar, Red turned his whole body to face the screen and flew upwards, and then slamming back down in an attempt to crush Solomon. When that failed, he tried to devour Solomon like he did with Mothra, but he wouldn't be eating my monster this time. 
I thought I had won. But something was wrong. Red wasn't sinking to the bottom. And I still couldn't move. Red was still alive. <laughs> As the finale part one, you ready to move in the finale part two? Did I mess with your mess with you again, Momo? Let's fucking do this. I'm yeah. um, 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 let's go. Let's, I'm guessing you really this. like the voice I gave Red. I dig this shit. Yes, <laughs> of course I do. All right, fucking beautiful. All right, I'm ready. All right, let's do this. All right, chapter eight, finale, part two. After his seeming defeat by Solomon, Red had reconstructed his body into his gigantic final form, transporting us to a blazing inferno in the process. It was reminiscent of our first encounter, except now the scenery, much like the true power of Red, had become very real. The music had erupted into a loud blaring sound. A furious drum of death. Faced against Red's ins insane amount of health, my own demise. Solomon was my strongest monster, but he never, not even he, stood a chance. It was like trying to fight a mountain. Within seconds, Solomon was overpowered and dropped to the floor. When Red crushed him to death underfoot, underneath his foot, the sadistic demon took his time as he snapped Solomon's vertebrae and ribs like dry brittle twigs. I could tell he was enjoying our pain. This is hopeless. I'm a dead man. I had no choice but to send another monster to its death. We were all going to die. I only hope they would forgive me. After decreasing Red's health by a minuscule amount, Angiris was also obliterated. Red unleashed a hail of blazing hot needles into his face until he collapsed. Another moment of unspeakable agony. The nothingness as my ally faded away. I asked Red how he knew my name. And then he said it. <sighs> For years, she was being tortured by something nobody understood. Now, I knew what it was. Now I understood why I was mocked about Melissa's death and how the game knew about it. Because he knew about it. Because he was the one responsible. And this time, he was going to kill me. Sad. Dear last monster, I will end this 
this futile struggle. Those taken back to the boards to send Godzilla to his final stand. Barely anything was left on the board, just Godzilla and Red's icons and the fifth monster. In the midst of everything that was happening, I, I had completely forgotten about it. I tried yet again to select it. I cursed, I, I begged, I screamed at it to do something, anything to help me. To no avail. There was only one thing to do. I knew Godzilla didn't stand any more of a chance than the rest did. But maybe now that all the other monsters were gone, the, the fifth monster would find, might finally awaken. I managed to get to the creature's icon selected. I, and I pressed the A button as fast as I could. The, the icon started to shake as if I were desperately trying to move. It was then that Red decided that he was done playing fair. And before I could activate the monster, he went for the killing blow. Paralyzing my heart. My hands started to become numb and unfeeling. But even as my vision was fading away, I still tried to press the A button. Red Shirley was breaking one of his rules, but he must have thought that if he could kill me quickly, then it would be too late for any consequences to matter. He would have won. He was wrong. Red's power was being challenged by another force. It prevented him from killing me. And then when I regained my vision, I saw a familiar sight. Mm. Zach, we don't have much uh, time. Dragon, this is me. Oh, oh is if you can, it, it, if you want it, you can. Blue. You can be blue if you want to, but it's a, I, it's a wait, chick. Yeah. I, I Solomon only had one line. Oh. I, I didn't know that was Solomon. I thought I was just blue in general. No. You, wanna be, you can be if you want to be, but this is a, this is a chick. So, yeah. And you're not. You are not a femoid, so. Yeah, yeah but I can go. All right. Anyway, on back to the story. I'll have to edit that out later. All good. I'll just read over, back over the part. Yeah. Red's power was being challenged by another force. It prevented him from killing me. And when I regained my vision, I saw a familiar sight. Zach, we don't have much time. Who are you? You already know me. I am Melissa. What? How is that possible? Rhea told me that he killed you. It it's true. Even after death, he tortures me. If you can't stop him, he'll do the same to you. But how will I be able to stop him now? I can't find Red, but there is one who can. I will release him from Red's grasp. Don't give up. I love you. Her words stirred something inside me. I wasn't going to die like this. And I had more to fight. I had more to fight her for I, than just my own life. I had to fight to save Melissa. 
and the world she inhabits. With her help, the final monster was finally unleashed. It was time to end this. Once and for all, together, we would take this damned hell spawn out of existence. Asius was by far the strongest playable monster in the game. He had to be if we were to have any chance of surviving. His punch involved turning his hands into blades, which caused tremendous damage. But Red had more than enough life to spare. In the end, it would come down to pure skill. With one final strike, Red was destroyed. His body disintegrated and sank below, accompanied by a soar of triumphant music. Slowly, the paralysis wore off, and I was able to stand again. We had done it. Melissa's death had been revenged. And I felt overwhelming happiness until I remembered all the death and pain that led up to this point. All the monsters who had fought and died. I was about to mourn them, but, but the game had yet to conclude. Tears of joy streamed down my face, and I broke down crying. I cried harder than I had in several years, maybe in my whole life. All I'd been through, all I'd discovered, and now the game was coming to an end. But before she and the others left, Melissa had something to tell me. You have saved us. And we'll, we are forever grateful. We'll be together again. Someday. Yes, Godzilla. Epilogue. I am Zachary, and at the time I write this, it has been three weeks since that fateful night I played the NAS Godzilla game. Going back to that night to immediately after I turned off the NES, once I was able to start walking around again, the first thing I did was unplug the NES, take out the cartridge and then put them in separate sock drawers. I looked over at the computer. All the screenshots you've seen in the story were saved. I backed up all the images on a flash drive before I turned the computer off, just in case. After that, I hit the bed and instantly passed out. It was not a restful sleep, but one of complete exhaustion. It felt like no time had passed before I'd woke again. And what a day that was. I first thought, but the first thought I recall coming to mind was, what the hell happened last night? I thought about it for a short while until it occurred to me to contact the person I got the game from to begin with, Billy. So I called him up and told him just, to just come over to my apartment, which he did. And I showed him the screenshots and gave him a very basic summary of what happened. At first he thought it was pulling a joke on him, but he soon realized that, that was not the case. Once it hit him, this was real. He was speechless. He, he made it clear that 
he had absolutely not tampered with the game and had no idea about any of this. So then the obvious question to Billy was, where did you get it from? I got the simple answer of uh, another friend of mine that I trade games with. He assured me that this was a trustworthy person and he had never had any issues with games he had got from them before. So then Billy called him. But when we told this guy the story, he was as shocked and surprised as anyone, except he abruptly hung up on us. This was clearly glowing nowhere. Before Billy left that day, he asked me if I wanted to, him to take the cartridge and dispose of it. I sharply declined. He asked how I could possibly still want to keep the thing. I told him that I needed time to think it over, and that was that. Billy and I haven't talked much since. Even though I told him that this isn't the case, I get the impression that Billy thinks what happened to the, with the game is my, his fault. After he left that day, I did a lot of thinking. It was very hard for me to do anything else, really. I couldn't stop thinking about that game. There were so many questions left unanswered. What was Red? Was Melissa really in the game? How did she even get there? Why did it all this happen with this game? But the question that kept me up for so many nights was, Red said he had known me for a long time. How? Ever since then, I can't shake the feeling of being watched. The game made me ask myself questions about death and reality in ways that I never wanted to think about. I'm not too sure of anything anymore. Constantly thinking about it soon began to have a negative impact on my life. I just didn't care about anything else at that point. By comparison, all the other day-to-day -day activities just seemed utterly pointless. I eventually decided that I had to choose between one or two things. Try to play the thing game again, or destroy it. I tried several times to convince myself to try to do the former, but I never got farther than plugging the NES back up. Just touching the cartridge made me remember the faint pain I felt during the fight with Red. I wondered if perhaps playing the game again myself might cause something terrible to happen. I didn't know anything about how this game worked, and it was too risky. I, I wasn't sure I could stand another round of the game anyway. So then it was time to take the other option. Wanting to get some fresh air, I took the game with me and drove to the lake, planning to throw it in. got up to the lake with the cartridge in my hands and I looked down on it and I, I thought of Melissa. If what had experienced, if what I had experienced in the game was indeed genuine, doing what I did may have been the only way to save her from endless torture. In a way, this warped game might have saved her soul. Once that thought came into my head, I knew that I would, wouldn't be able to destroy it. So I sat down in a bench, gazing at the lake for about an hour. Ultimately, I decided on a third option. Selling the game on eBay. It may be selfish, but I promise you that it had nothing to do with money. I don't care how much or little I get paid for this game, believe me. It's selfish because I don't want the responsibility of owning this cartridge anymore. 
I cannot dwell on it this forever. And the only way I can deal with this is by putting the game out of my life. So this brings me to the main reason I created the summary of these events. First is to record the details while I can remember them. And second is that whoever bids on this game knows what they're getting into. I can't guarantee the safety of anyone else who plays this game or that anything will happen, but to the new owner of this game, remember this. Be careful. And if you feel as if the game is literally messing with your head, shut the damn thing off. That's that's pretty much the end. There's an alternate ending where he like it's it's a like a troll pasta ending where he like explodes it and shatters the thing. But yeah. That's 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 the whole end. Good job, Adam. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, this <laughs> Yeah, this this voice that voice is God. That was the voice I heard from downstairs. Yeah, you didn't oh expect it. My... You don't expect that voice ever coming from my mouth, but I can do that voice I perfectly. I it from anyone's mouth. Lord have mercy. Yeah, oh, I, God. I, I've trained my vocal cords to do that voice. <laughs> I can do it for like hours on end without hurting my vocal cords. Congratulations. It's terrifying <laughs> yeah, I heard that shit for the first time I was like oh, great heavens <laughs> great heavens uh, well you know if it's a voice that makes you go uh, good heavens or great heavens I think it's probably the appropriate voice it was an appropriate voice mm. Uh, also, Adarnas also said hi to us, and also said, uh, uh, awesome job, Momo, and great job to me. Yeah, that was fucking great. <laughs> and thank you. Thank you, Dragon, for providing the voice of Solomon. the man, the myth, the legend, Solomon. Yeah. The man's been whipping ass. One dot, it's all you need. He's a fucking, <laughs> he's a fucking hoss, okay? The man kicks ass. He shredded fucking. He shredded the shit out of Red's first form. He's been the best since 1973. This. Come on. He is an unmitigated badass. Yeah. I have never heard of a Solomon from any. And, uh, any. Godzilla movie. No, no. Solomon is an act is a demonic entity. Yeah, yeah. I know that. Is a demon. Yeah, he he didn't. He apparently he was in cahoots with Red at some point, and that point apparently they've they've they have severed their detente and yeah. There were a couple, and they decided to break up. You know, <laughs> you know, honestly, you know what? <laughs> yeah, that's one of the things, like, I know people were like, what the fuck, how did Solomon, Yeah, you know, because the way he gets Solomon is because of uh, the face thing. Yeah. So, so what the fuck? I I found Bright's gender. I'm putting it in dumb post. Oh, for fuck's sake. Gender? Mm-hmm. Omen. Omen. <laughs> Omen. Is that, she is, is that a way of saying scary force. woman? She is an unstoppable force. Uh, Example A. <laughs> she is a very scary lady oh yeah and what you can see at the end like at the very very end when um it's really cool actually 
um like when like uh, melissa resurrects all the monsters and shit his his eyes are blue so he's like no under it like his eyes used to be red and shit yeah. his eyes are like completely blue instead of being red which is great yeah fuck fuck that all that shit my favorite part of the stream is still freaking out Momo with my voice. <laughs> I was talking about my heart. I didn't know. I was like, wait, where? I was like, where? Like, I figured, I was like, you really wanted to to to, to, to do the voice. And I was like, okay, well, you know, all right. You, you, that, that sounds great. I mean, yeah, but I was like, oh, you're going to, you know, what would what would the voice of a possessing entity sound like? Like oh jeez, oh that's what it. Okay then. <laughs> the only thing that sucks about that voice is I was paid minimum wage for it when I had that job. God Almighty! Minimum wage is actually pretty good for voice acting jobs. No, yeah, I was at an amusement well... park. Yeah, they were at an amusement park. park. More, uh, she had to do more than just the voice. Yeah. yeah she had to fucking actually perform and hide places and shit. Bright, Bright's fairly small, though, so. Hey! <laughs> no, because the worst part is, is apparently one of the side effects of estrogen is you shrink. Well, no, Bright's already. Yeah. On the shorter side, though. <laughs> you, you're gonna lose some inches, Bright. I hate you. Look, let's be real. A few, like an inch you or two what? off of your height are going to be worth it on the fancy lady medicine. It's going to be worth it. It'll be like five four, <laughs> or five three. Do I have permission to throw a dragon at a wall? No. Damn Although it. some 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 <laughs> uh some trans women are really tall. I'm going to comment bright if you ever feel bad about being a short lady, there's plenty of men who really like short ladies. I don't care. <laughs> I personally couldn't care less. There's also women who really like short ladies, but this is also true. I do not know which one you want to go for, but either way. I'm going to shut up. <laughs> uh, yeah, if I remember correctly, I was paid nine fifty an hour to do that voice think, and acting. I think one of the weirdest things about... Uh, hormone replacement therapy is the fact that as you're transitioning medically, like how your proportioned changes. Like I think on estrogen, oh, yeah. Like, yeah, like I think on est estrogen, if I remember correctly, your weight goes to your hips, while when you're on testosterone, it goes more like to your shoulders or some shit, if I remember correctly. Well, yeah, androgynous, androgynous. Um... Well, like, Brendan, that's you, you, because hormones do a lot in the body. You'd be yeah. surprised how important of a role they play. Yeah. They decide so much more than people give it credit for. Yeah. Like when people take performance enhancing drugs, uh, especially uh, yeah. a lot of guys and even a lot of girl, uh, ladies who take like uh, performance enhancing drugs. Um, also, they take... actually, why one of the reasons. Well, one of the sexist reasons why women with high levels of testosterone aren't allowed to compete with other women, even though they're born with that amount of testosterone. It's sexist, but they also go, well, testosterone makes you more muscular and... It, 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 like, so if you get on, like, TRT, which... There was, uh, actually, there was one tennis player who was disallowed from a certain event because she has high levels of testosterone. And they said, you can only enter if you take a drug. She's like, no. 
Yeah, some shit is weird. Like, the, I don't know why. Yeah. Oh, it's because there's this weird history of men being afraid of athletic women. In well, Europe. it's also it's also another thing too, where it's like if you um if you have a certain level of whatever in your body, then that means you're taking some form of ana- like some form of steroid. And they don't want to risk it on being like an anabolic steroid. No, I'm talking about racer. women, but they know for a fact uh, it has that level naturally. Well, yeah. Yeah, no, what I'm These what women I'm saying also is, tend is to be taller than normal women and more muscular. Yeah, just because of that fact. But like, I. I would say I'm it's not it's not like an I'm not giving them like an excuse. I'm more saying that like yeah. one of the reasons why is because of like 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 PDs. They want they like, you know, if you what? Get your if you get your blood work done and you have um you have like certain levels because it's very hard to kind of like gauge how much estrogen or testosterone you kinda of have to walk that type rope between. Um especially when you take performance enhancing drugs that they will like kick you oh, out from well, no no I'm not talking performance enhancements I'm talking about people they know for a fact have it naturally they're saying it's not fair because women aren't supposed to have it and they know it's natural huh? okay There's... that's supposed to have it as a kind of like yeah, it's, it's like, very we subjective. Know that like, you have this naturally, we know that you're supposed to have it because you were born with it. But you know, we don't think it's fair, and that women aren't supposed to be that strong. Yeah, I'm supposed to have it. My gosh. <laughs> also, uh, I have to do something for Twitch chat because some people in Twitch chat did not hear my red voice. Oh. Oh. Oh no. Uh, wait, is it not going through? Okay. It's not going through. It's not going through Twitch stream chat. What the fuck? Streamlabs, pick up my damn voice. <laughs> no. There, I, how, how is it I can hear it? <laughs> then how can we hear it? Can I don't know, but... Picking up sounds. Okay. It looks like I'm... You can hear it because we're in Discord. Yeah, yeah, it looks like I'm gonna have to literally record the voice. You, you're just gonna have to record it separately. God, God, why? Oh. Gosh, damn it! Fuck you, Streamlabs. Fuck you, Twitch. Well, if they picked up everything else. Angry that Brett has gotten such a spooky voice that apparently Penguin has upgraded her from normal woman to omen women, woman. <laughs> omen. Oh, <man. laughs> omen. I look in dumb post. Penguin put omen. up a picture of a theme. Yes, I, I yeah. <laughs> The omen. I guess looks like a buff woman. Drunk. Oh, it's just wide. I just mean, wide as shit. I mean, tomorrow is an editing day. Oh, it's gonna fun. be so much fun. You're gonna have to go through. You're gonna have to go. No, no. <laughs> it's gonna be so, so much fun. Me. <laughs> you mean to tell me that you're gonna have to go through and read all and, and well and record voice lines for red and then edit that in? Yeah. To the actual video while you're also editing the fucking pictures in the visual aids because the he took the because of the screen caps. Yes. Oh, this is bullshit. Yeah, uh Bookram said I didn't realize there was a voice until Momo had reacted. Oh fuck. <laughs> Oh fuck yeah! So yeah, Streamlabs um, and Twitch should not pick it up at all. If it makes you, it makes everyone on stream feel better. Bright's voice when doing the the voice is terrifying, like you would expect a demon, like a terrifying yeah, it caught me demon completely lady. Off guard. 
ready to Had rob no. your soul or rob your life or one of them, maybe both. <laughs> it, it, it caught me completely off guard. It caught all of us off guard, but m mostly me. I was trying to see if there were the other OBS for work. <laughs> oh, wait, the other OBS is picking it up. So maybe you won't have to re Are you fucking serious? The other one is working, but Streamlabs doesn't. Fuck you, Streamlabs. Maybe your audio settings for Streamlabs is weird. Y'all, y'all want to hear something fucking confusing as shit? Now I'm gonna, I'm gonna put up like a slight thing. Uh, I clicked on their account to see what the fuck. Um, the first thing that shows up on the recommendations after you click on their account is, I'm quoting this. Straight lesbians and uh, multi-spectrum lesbians, which not those are not lesbians. What the fuck? So what? Prepare to be a straight woman. But yeah, that's yeah. just straight. That's that's just. I... It's okay to be straight, but you can't call yourself a straight lesbian. That makes no sense. <laughs> those oh, do not correlate. My just being... fucking god. What? Did it, what? Did it pick up? Is it good? No. no, I figured out the problem. Streamlabs decided, oh, you, oh, wow, this is terrible background noise, not an actual voice. So oh. it kept it from oh. going through because it thought it was background noise. That's just so me. <laughs> <That's> Damn. Me. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> Fuck Damn, you. they really... They don't fucking like you. <laughs> no, they do not. Creativity oh, being punished. <laughs> How did your shit get red as background that. noise? I don't know. Not only that, when you go on this person's account and you click on who they're following, they unironically follow people that call them bo um, themselves lesboy. Les like... How the fuck? Huh? What? Did you say lesboy? Yeah, I Wait. did not mispronounce something. Okay, so hold on. What? I, let's actually and turn someone... on this off. Like, hold on. And someone that is bi vero straight bian. What the fuck is a straight bian? I am all for Who knows? micro labels, things like that. What the fuck is a straight bian? Alright, so I'm gonna try to red voice now. Hold on. Jesus Christ on a fucking stick. <laughs> I, scared. Honestly, I feel like right. No, I just it, it was no, it was so loud in my ears. I have my fucking volume turned up. I'm like, ah, Jesus, well. Right. <laughs> oh. I, what do we... <laughs> Bright She's whispering her demon voice into your ears. Uh, I I just I was like I actually had right to pull my fucking. <laughs> I scared the shit out of my. I had to pull my fucking. No, I had to pull my fucking. You didn't scare me. Just, well, I I heard. I heard. I, mean, I knew it was coming. I just. I didn't. It was so loud in my ears. I had to actually pull my cans off my head. Yeah, noise suppression destroyed it. Like it would not allow it to go through. Ah right, damn. But turning yeah, noise tell the noise profession that you don't give two French fried titty fucks how it feels. Fucking do it. Yeah, but turning it off uh, actually allows it to be heard. <laughs> so Book from Moderna finally got to hear that voice that everyone in the voice chat loved for Red. I, I, when I was thinking of the voice for Red, I was either thinking for a deep either a deep menacing voice or that voice and i decided yeah this will be more creepy <laughs> was i yeah right? well you have to go with creepy because yeah. it is a fucking is a fucking it's a <laughs> demon that possesses people so i i think i fit the role perfectly congratulations for being a very terrifying woman maybe I feel Ooh, like did you just meow. <laughs> I feel like whenever we do horror stories or whatever horror story streams, if someone wants me, if someone wants to do someone, 
All right, so if someone wants to do a voice for a ghost, like someone needs a voice for a ghost, I'm probably going to be asked to do it. it do it because of fucking Red. Because <laughs> I can do a, go a ghost voice really well. <laughs> I don't mind it. I find it fun. I love making people creepy. Uh... I love it very well. <laughs> How to be a scary woman. <laughs> Point one, bright. <laughs> Point two, bright. <laughs> yeah, I've had like three years of experience of le learning how to scare people as well as different forms of voice acting. So I can really change the attitude really quickly. <laughs> I mean, it's totally fine. Yeah, it's like totally second nature to me. I can just like drop it out of nowhere. So I'm almost not the only okay, voice actor. Oh, I heard you. I heard you. I heard you. <sighs> like breathing, and I was like breathing to like to get ready to prepare to do that voice, and I was like, okay, what? This could be on one of a couple things. <laughs> like, and then it actually, I was like, oh wow, that is yes. Yeah, that's that's actually really amazing. So yeah, basically, uh, there's now two voice actors in the group: me and Momo. <laughs> yeah, I, I. I'm not a professional. Yeah, I'll say I that. <laughs> I'm not a professional. I can do pretty decent voice acting. Yeah, I liked you coming in as fucking being being Solomon. Yeah. Just be like, bitch, fuck you. <laughs> which is what you do, which is what you say to Brad on a regular basis anyway. Yeah. <laughs> Just eat shit, bitch. Yeah. <laughs> this is pretty fun. Like, I don't mind, like, if you guys uh want to do another group thing where I am... You're doing this for three hours. Holy smokes. I... <laughs> oh, God. Yeah, but anyway. I didn't realize how long this took. Yeah, it took oh. a while. Oh, my God. Oh. A couple bit of it was you guys freaking out of the voice. <laughs> well, I didn't... Yeah, this is... Oh, gosh. Yeah, but, uh, I feel like I might be asked to, like, do, uh, like, serial killer voices or ghost voices for other stories who will, uh, want to be read. Because I can, I can do the voices really well. The only voice, uh, they wanted to try and teach me, I tried my hardest to do it. I cannot do a clown voice. I cannot do it. Make me happy. I feel like you're creepy enough, so... I see you. That's as close as I can get to it. That's as oh, close yeah. as I can I'm get to it. I'm glad you can't do a good creepy clown voice, because you're already fucking creepy enough. That's as close as I can get to it. <laughs> Is that high pitch voice? We don't, we don't need you bouncing around and fucking. <laughs> but I can do other creepy voices. Adarna says that sounds pretty close. Also, uh, I I'll be right back. All right, be right back. Hydrate or dehydrate. Jerry, okay, so the thing I was talking about, Jerry, I put it in, uh, I put it in Alphia, uh, Mafia, yeah, Alphabet Mafia. I, I, Why do you want me to hear about people who are possibly trying to erase what lesbian is with a new version of straight? Oh, it's not just that. It's just completely, it, it feels like people are just treating the terminology lesbian as an aesthetic. Because the thing is, I understand being attracted to women. I get that 100%. You, bi lesbians are not a thing that is just a bisexual with a preference for women. Or just non-men in general. That is, that is okay to say that you are bisexual with a preference. 
That is, that's fine. Why the fuck? That bi lesbian is not only just rude to lesbians, but also just bisexuals. What the fuck? Like, if if you're if bisexual, you just say it. Lesbian, it kind of feeds into the narrative that you don't actually think bisexual women exist. Which yeah. has been an issue for a lot of bi women. There's an old friend I met on Gaia, like a 2003, 2004, some shit. And one thing her and her girlfriend always had issues with was telling other people in the queer community they were bi. So they just eventually, they eventually started saying they were pan because they were, wouldn't be attacked that way. Which is insane. Yeah. Because there's this old narrative that bi women are just pretending. Which they're not. They are very real. Very, very real and very, very cool. Like, what the fuck is a straight bean? A straight woman who's too fucking stupid to just say it out loud. <laughs> I'm sorry to say it like that. I'm sorry. No, because I, I feel like the thing, it's tr- like, the, one of the things that I saw when I first heard the terminology of, of a straight lesbian is someone that, that was only calling themselves a straight lesbian because they found the aesthetic of being a lesbian appealing. What the fuck about being a lesbian is appealing? aesthetically what constantly being shit on by the queer community constantly having characters taken away or shows that are pretty decent lesbian representation just canceled what the fuck what the fuck about that is appealing aesthetically i'm going to say something that you probably won't fully get immediately better you will i don't know but It's a lot easier to see the good parts of a community and not the downsides if you're not part of it. This goes for basically every minority. Like, people will think, oh, Mexican's awesome, they got all this good food, and they won't look at all the shit that they're put through in the United States and in even their own country. People will say like, oh, I like rap. Black people are awesome which I find it questionable when people talk like that, but... You'll never hear anybody. Well, <laughs> I <laughs> should say here, here, so, like, you'll have people say, like, yeah, like... Yeah, you, you know what I mean. Like, that rap music is cool, like, but they rarely, if ever, will say anything about, like... Yeah, they, those like, would be they, the same people yeah. that don't know about basic, bare basic old things about Black people rights, uh, rights from of black people like the doll experiment which is one of the bare basics I feel like I learned that when I was a tiny tiny child from then again I also have a sister who's not exactly the whitest person and I had to see yeah, that face to face but I also knew about the experiment which is different than seeing my sister Oh, and also, those same people do not know how it's like that even in modern times, a lot of people of color have family members who are still shot and killed for existing, not even doing anything bad. And then the news will like take these out of, take these pictures and cut it up so it's out of context, they look more sinister, and it's just, and they'll, they'll make shit up to, so the police officer doesn't look bad, and they'll just be like, this is the cool thing about black people. Look at their music. Look at those clothes. Look at the hair. And I hate that people talk like that. And I sound bad. I I feel like I feel I I feel bad just repeating that. But people say it, and oh, think of it like that, Penguin. When they when they try to use lesbian, they're not looking at the issues lesbian women had to go through or the issues bisexual women had to go through. They just want the aesthetic. They want to take advantage of it, and they also think that. They probably think lesbian women need to be taken down a peg or two, which is <sighs> also something minorities have to deal with sometimes because how do I say this in a way to not insult people like that? People are 
are magical. There we go. People are magical. Would anyone like to add anything to that? Apparently, straight gays are a thing, and I put it also in alph Alphabet Mafia. And the flag is her as horrendous as you would guess. What in the living fuck is that? Alright, your horror scare actor is back. What did I miss? Oh, Actual yeah. horror? Just, just yeah. I terrible flag design. I explained uh, an issue to Penguin, or I tried to. Uh, would you like to repeat the thing I explained, Momo, if you want to? I Basically, I we were referring to... I was... Um, it's my understanding that basically, if I could, if I could summarize, basically, um, it's e you, you, your point was that it's easier to kind of see the good parts of a movement if you are a part of it. But it's e well, but, well, it's e it's 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 easier to see the flaws of a, of a certain, any given movement if you are not from within that movement. So, for instance, like, you know, there's a lot of, um, there, there's a lot of good that a lot of the, like, um, that the LGBT, um, community broadly has done with a lot of, like, uh, like, like characters and, like, you know, making sure that, like, people know, you know, uh, with regards to exposure of, like, uh, queer voices and queer people, um, from all walks of life, um, you know, stories and movies and um, characters and all that shit. And it's, and it's fucking great. And, um, but like, what people don't really see is um, the fact that a lot of like pride shit and a lot of LGBT shit is still from this like elitist, white, um, kind of like, uh, is it still kind of like yeah like in this like um steeped in this elitism and this kind of like uh heteronormativity with regards to whiteness um and that that's that's one of the things that i kind of see um just uh being being black um and speaking of being black um like one of the things that like with regards to um like popular culture especially with regards to music and entertainment like I've, I've said it before and i'll say it again the world loves black culture but they hate black people and part of that is because um so much of um black culture especially like when it comes to music and entertainment and art has been commodified in this uh, capitalist society and when you have tied um money um in this uh in this structure to success um you will have people who want to take that who want to take that uh money take that experience and they want to basically um you know keep all the benefits of that of that culture and you know that aesthetic and push away the people who were a part of that like um it's kind of like the cholo and chola thing like that cholo and chola aesthetic um people like to like you know dress like that like Haley bieber dresses kind of like that with the, the chola aesthetic with the flannels and the you know the uh, kind of like the high um, pompadourish kind of hair and the jean like the the work uh, the the uh, dickies and dicky pants and the fucking converse and shit, but like without really understanding or understand uh, like without even really like gathering what it means to be like a chola, you know what I mean? So that's that's a lot of it. It's basically what we're referring to. I feel like I did a a soft marshmallow version, and Momo was like, "I'll summarize," and then goes darker. Well, I I just wanted to like kind of 
I wanted to kind of consecrate it a little bit more. Um, that makes sense. Me. But we're two very different people. Like for some reason, even though I'm not a kid anymore, I always worry about scaring people because I hated people running from me so much. I hated people being scared of me so much. I've as I'm sure I've said multiple times, I even altered my entire voice so I wouldn't be able to talk like this around people and I would sound like the voice I typically use to the point where I became alienated alienated from my own voice because that's the thing it, that can happen to people when you're othered and I didn't actually think about there being possible solutions until uh, when I was in my uh, late 20s or early 30s, which I know is a very long time to think of a solution when you see it everywhere. But my mom asked me to find a uh, ballerina music box for a family friend because that family friend's kid she I'm sure you've heard this before but I had heard it before when I was growing up but hearing about a younger generation having to go through it really hurt and my mom wanted to mitigate that by finding uh dolls and toys that were pretty and had her skin tone so i had so i looked for a black ballerina box and what was kind of disturbing about looking for that is not only was it hard but there were a lot of ballerina music boxes that basically used black children as an external uh aesthetic like there would be pictures of little black girls on the box and inside there would be a white ballerina like why why do you use the black mermaid girl or the little black girl doing her hair and then you have this white girl inside why don't why can't she be the prize and i eventually found it but man i feel like a lot of the stuff too um penguin with a lot of that is that it maybe if these people understood like like you say I like the terminology like maybe if they just like you know refer to themselves as queer they could have like bypassed a lot of or, like just or just like I feel like a lot of people forget that unlabeled is a terminology that is completely valid yeah. or like you can just make or, up or your own terminology all. It's fine to make also. It. It's like, hey, if you want to, you know, personally, I don't, you know, I'm not, I'm not going, you know, get too, get too uh, bogged down into that. But I feel like a lot of these guys kind of like miss the mark when they, a lot of, a lot of these cats miss the mark where they, where this is shit is concerned because it's like, you, like, you, you have, you have, you have over, like you have over laden this this shit to the point to where you don't even you don't even realize that you're actually like describing the and like you are you were fucking describing the antithesis of what you think you are actually describing yeah yeah it this is the like i said maybe if they learned Catch all terms like uh, like queer or something like that. Mm -hmm. They they like, call it a lot of this, but personally, these people, I don't really people like this. I really don't give two French fried titty fucks about, regardless. <laughs> so, I don't think you should either. Yeah, it, it made me feel... realize something, Momo. They probably don't even know the origin of the term lesbian coming from a woman yeah. from the island of Lesbos. Lesbos who yeah. wrote lesbian poetry, but was so scared of being outed as a lesbian, she said, yeah, I totally have a husband. His name is Dick Man Dick. That's how much of a fan <laughs> he is. <laughs> Earl Penisman! 
<laughs> Richard <laughs> Dixon. Richard Dixon. <laughs> but I, I, I have a wife. He took a trip to Westbos. Harold Peterson. Yeah, even in ancient Greece, women were hiding being lesbians, and of course, in the they had to hide even more. Which is fucking crazy. Wait, no. modern ages. They went, women, lesbians ended up becoming old uh, friends that lived together. They were roommates. That's where that term came from. <laughs> so like, oh, no, they're just old spinsters who could never get yeah, one. Yeah, just roommates. Each other. Just roommates. No, <laughs> no, just, you know, just completely platonic roommates they want to get buried in a casket together perfectly platonic roommates perfectly platonic they share every perfectly platonic no 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 degeneracy no deviancy no no nothing like that they 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 have they they've exchanged vows completely platonic there's no way there's no Uh, way i've even heard possible way people the moms going Oh, I wonder where Aunt Such and Such sleeps. There's only one bed. There's only one bed, you know. <laughs> you no, know, oh, well. Yeah, I mean, you know, you couldn't possibly be. Couldn't possibly be. Could not be the case. Uh is still definitely a super needed term. If they need some unknown term, it's fine, but but if they're not a lesbian, they should not use the term lesbian. Yeah, it, the thing is, it feels like so the thing with like sexual orientations is unlike gender because gender can is like more of like a, just a purely aesthetic thing or like what you go by for like pronouns, even though pronouns and gender aren't well, gender directly isn't correlated. Quite that like one of the one of the things that makes me a trans guy isn't liking guy things. Mm-hmm. I have the brain of a man. Like I even exist. It does not exist. You know how hard it it was yeah. to pick shirts out before Spood and started helping me because my brain kept telling me they don't exist. Gender is all the a gender. lot of shirts didn't fit right. Also, it's the, basically yeah. just all the characteristics that pertain to whichever, um, like, so, bi- yeah. bimodal uh, Gender expression. is more than what you wear. It even is. I don't feel like it's related to what you wear, but... Hey, well, there's one thing I wanted to tell you. You do realize sound alerts are off because of the stream, right? I just realized that. <laughs> I will refund you. <laughs> <laughs> oh thank god i was about to say um, no <laughs> hold on i could probably do that right now like let's see let's go over. But unlike like sexual on moonflower's reaction in alphabet mafia because i feel one very one. connected to that right now oh <sighs> It is, it is for each one in the morning, so I'm uh, gonna have to take a I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have to, to, to take a quick siesta. Oh man, this is fun though. This. This entire stream was awesome, but also left on a very dark note. I think, okay, so the thing is, gender is a very, very open thing. It's all, you know, it's not very, it's hard to confine to one thing, you know? But That's why they call it fluid. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, a, it's a social construct yeah. in the, you know, well, I'm not, not going to get into it. Social, but also, it. Uh, it's related to the brain. And like culture and things like that, it's it connected yeah. to several things. Like I said, it's just all those yeah characteristics but, between like how much like whatever you express, you know. Yeah, 
Or with like sexual orientation. Sexual orientations are boxes. Labels are like the for sexual orientations are boxes, meaning they have a a strict set of things that give you that label. Now you can go like outside of them. There are certain reaches, but they are still boxes. You know, and it's like that's why bi lesbians can't exist because that just goes out too far of the box. Well, if your Where whole it's not thing, even the box. Well, if your whole thing is that this, this is the definition, and this word means X, and I will adhere to this because it's X, um, and you have tied Y to X, then it's like the 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 shit loses its its descriptive power. The only reason we have words is to like you know give them descriptive power it's like it's, you have heard of the you know the phrase there are no married bachelors well, why is that because we have literally defined the word bachelor as a as an unmarried man bachelor is a shortening word for unmarried man and if a man is unmarried you can't have a married unmarried man like saying uh, saying you have a a, mar a married bachelor exists would be the same thing as saying a a married unmarried man exists. The the sentence makes less than no sense. It makes like anti sense because the shit the shit can't exist like by definition. So yeah, yeah. Because the thing is, the terminology lesbian has changed into like recent years where it changed from strictly being women attracted to women to anyone that is not a man attracted to other people that are not men which i feel like that's a positive change that makes sense it's still in what lesbian is but it, it, when you tack on several things to where like oh lesbians can be attracted to men that's not what a lesbian is. That's going completely against what the terminology lesbian is. Like, that's the complete opposite. Yeah. Now, there are issues where people attraction. will be use this to be transphobic against trans women, or just, like, just rude in general. But um, it, it's still... Men, cis or trans, or just, like, demiboys, things like that, cannot be lesbians and like ace lesbians aro ace lesbians those are cool those are fine because they're still lesbians they don't their other things don't contradict with being a lesbian they're not using it for aesthetic purposes like these like bi lesbians i don't i still don't but know what the fuck aero, that is. but if they're aro ace wouldn't that aro ace is a spectrum well yeah also, Momo, uh, apparently I have to wait 20 minutes to give you your points back. That's fine. I'm about to fucking pass out. <laughs> <laughs> and listen I'm about to pass to... out, I won't even notice. Yeah, you gotta listen, listen to uh, bullshit from child. It's fine. We all have to do it eventually. Alright. <laughs> I'm heading I'm out. Alright, see ya. Y'all yeah. take care, alright? See ya. Peace out. <laughs> Jesus. Peace out. <laughs> uh, I guess so. I should probably end stream, shouldn't I? Yeah. I'm just going on a rant. But it's just like, these... The contradiction just kind of seems like they don't care about like the history and the terminology and the struggles that lesbians go through or bisexuals for that matter they don't care about either group that they are claiming is one thing so they're just completely erasing those two communities struggles in the, in history for, for just for what because the thing is from my understanding is i'm pretty sure by like most people that call themselves bi lesbians are completely like really fucking transphobic and do not see trans women as women Like, yeah. from, like, what I have seen, that is what I have gathered, is they do not see trans women as women. They see trans women as their assigned gender at birth. 
anyway. Which is really fucking gross because what? Huh? Yeah, I get it. But anyways, uh, Jerry, last words go. Yeah, I'll... my last words are. It's cool enjoying the nice things you see in minority cultures, but a lot of people who are not part of a minority would probably pee themselves or cry to themselves if they had to deal with what others had to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Dragon, last words, go. Don't, don't be dumb. Like, it's, it's okay to express yourself in several ways. But just don't, don't, don't just do whatever the fuck I was going on a rant about. Like, don't do that. Don't, don't, just, just double, just double think. You know? But do, do the, the, the think thing that you were taught in school about internet safety. Mm -hmm. Just do, do that before you embarrass yourself. Yeah. Yeah, also, uh, my last words. In order to get rid of dark matter, get light matter. What? <laughs> it's a pun. It's how you get rid of darkness, you get you use light. Get, how to get rid of dark matter, you get light matter. Stupid mm. pun. <laughs> Anyway, D class, hope you enjoyed the stream. Hope to see you guys later for another experiment.